Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to my shop. Oh wait, you can't see me yet. So I'm gonna move over here. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to my shop. Today we are sharpening everything. Um, <laughs> as uh, I, I'm not, I don't sharpen things quite as often as I should sharpen them. Uh, usually when the plane I'm using gets dull, it's just faster for me to grab one of the other planes and go to town on it. Uh, it's one of those things that just kind of holds me back a little bit and every now and then I get this backlog of planes that are all dull and so then I just sharpen them all at once. I find it easier to do them as a system rather than doing them individually as they come. But today we're going to be doing a bunch of other things. So we've got planes to sharpen, I've got um, a skewed molding plane, uh, we've got spoke shaves, we've got card scrapers, I'm probably going to do some of the other little things and then I've got uh, four or five saws that need to be sharpened. Uh, so we're going to be having a good bit of fun of this. If you're watching this recorded, then down below I have timestamps to everything I'm sharpening. So if you want to see how do I sharpen my Stanley number no. 7, uh, there's a timeline down for that. That'll get you roughly to where it is in the video. Uh, so if there's something specific you want me to sharpen, then throw it up there and I'll try and work that in between some of the others. So I'll probably do a plane and then a spoke shape and then a plane and then a skewed plane. Um, and we'll be going through a bunch of those. Um, also, my wife will probably be popping in and out. Um, so if she's not here, I have to be watching the chat. Um, so if I miss your comment, go ahead and throw it in there again. I'll try and get to as many as I can. If you do put up a super chat, um, those are a lot easier and I can see those. Um, and if there's something specific you really want me to sharpen, throw up a super chat and I'll, I'll work it into the system. Um, so, yeah, uh, pretty straightforward. This is going to be a very laid back live and we're just going to be uh, playing along with it and seeing what we get. So we're going to start off with my Stanley number no. 7. <sighs> it's a bit dusty because this one hasn't been sharpened in a while. I've got a project coming up where I'm going to need a good jointing plane. So we're going to uh, do this one. So, whoop. Bring you back. Let's take this thing apart and get to town. If anyone has any questions, I am trying to watch the live whenever possible. So we'll keep up with that. Now, theoretically, um, if I just need a light touch up, I'm gonna leave the chip breaker on here and I'm gonna come over here to the strop and I'm just going to strop it up. Um, but in this one, this one actually needs a little bit. It's, it's not quite as sharp as it should be. So we're going to take this apart and that will allow me to, wow, that one's really stuck, it's been a while. That will allow me to do a really clean edge on it. Rotate it so this never touches the very tip of the iron. Slide it out and pull it off. Now, because this one needs a good bit of work, we're coming over here to my course. If you want to see which plates I'm using, I have links to those in the description down below. Hey, good morning. Hey, how's it going? Lots of highs. Can you tell us, can you tell us the different stones you are using? Um, I have links to these down below if you want to see that. Um, but I have a course, a fine, and an extra fine. Um, DMT 8 inch plates. Um, and then I've got then extra course that I'll pull. Where did my extra, oh, my extra course is up here. I've got an extra course um, that I'll pull out if I really need to. Oops, just dropped my uh, sharpening floor. Probably broke a couple slipstones. Oh well, uh, we'll move on. <laughs> uh, the extra course is one that I'll bring out when I really need to grind something down. Um, if, if the blade needs quite a bit, like most of these, I'm going to start with my coarse. I'm going to go up. If it just needs a little touch-up, I might start with the fine or the extra fine, or I might just do the strop. Um, so, yeah. I'm going to set it on here. Fingers across here, trying to leave even pressure. And I have to get myself up a little bit higher, because uh, I'm usually I'm sharpening this down on a lower stand. But on the lower stand, well, you, you can't see it, so I'd bring it up here for the videos. Um, but I have a, a, that corner shelf over there where I normally do the sharpening. Hey, music lover, Richard Garrow, Roger Tubbs. Lots of fun people getting here. So I'm just going to get the liquid on here, and I'm just using uh, cheap window glass cleaner. It evaporates quickly, so there's no, um, uh, no rusting. And we're going to run on here. Usually that's about all it needs. And I'm going to look on this and see if I can see the scratch marks. Let me see if I can focus in on this. If I can see those scratch marks running all the way across, and I do, I feel on the back here, and there's an ever so slight burr here. No burr in the middle, no burr, no burr. So I need to do a little bit more. I've got a burr on this side. I need a burr from here over to there. So we're gonna do a little bit more. Sorry, focus again. Should be enough. No, I need a little more actually. 
My burr has now gone from here over to the middle. Now I need just over on that side. So I'm just putting a little bit more pressure on the side that needs the burr still. This one was a, a decent amount out, so it needed a good bit more work. Wipe it off. Wow, oh, still no burr over there. Needs a good bit more. Make sure that there's nothing else wrong with this. No, just round it a bit more on that side. I'm gonna clean off this junk. The fluid on diamond plates is to remove the, the buildup and the metal chips in there. Um, fluid on, on regular wet stones um, is there to actually create a slurry. There we go. Now I got the burr all the way across. So now that I have that, I'm just going to go right over the other plate. And these ones are far less because I'm just getting rid of the marks from the previous plate. Over to the last one. And I'm going to make sure. Nice and polished. And I need a little bit more on this side. And if you're having problems seeing the scratch difference, one thing you can do is change its skew. So if I, on this one, I'm skewed at an angle. On this one, I'm gonna come and be straight on. And that will put the scratches at a different angle so you can see them separately. And that's what I'm looking for. I'm just gonna put it over on this one. I don't take off the burr in between each one. Just do a little bit on that one, keeping it flat on there. I wanna make sure that the burr it's now flipped over on the other side. Actually, it's not. Just do this. There we go. Now the burr is rolled over onto this side. Clean off the plates. And then we're going to hit the strop. Hey, you got a super chat. I'll read it in just a moment here. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Flip it over. Do the back side. Two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten. There we go. Then I'm just going to work the burr back and forth, front, back, front, back, front, back, and there. Now that edge is sharp. And so I could test it by the hair sharpening and things like that, but it's one of those things eventually you know mm, that feels sharp. So that is all we need. I'm going to put this back in here. And what I do is normally when my planes are in storage, um, so I'm going to put it back in about, uh, there's about a, a sixteenth of an inch sticking out. And when my planes are in storage, um, I usually leave them with the iron where it was last set up. I don't retract the iron when I put it back in the storage. Um, but when I first sharpen them and I haven't actually adjusted anything, then I back it up so that next time I use it, I know it's not out. Um, uh, excuse me, I know the iron isn't sticking out, and that means I need to do adjustments on it. So I don't do adjustments until I get to the actual work, because every time I work, I'm going to want a different setup on it. Where did my cap iron? There it is. My uh, clever cap. Um, with very few exceptions, they're always in a different position or a different setup. So I back up the iron so it's not in there. That lets me know next time I use this, I need to set up the iron. But it's good to go. Let's see, what was that uh, super chat? Something you want to see me sharpen? Dan Shat, Sack, Sack it. Ah, there we are. Hey James, it's been a minute. Donating towards... <laughs> oh, I should get my dad joke book. Just a second. Sorry, I forgot about that. Yes, dad joke's coming up. <laughs> Usually Sarah is here and she'll be the one taking care of it. Um, but she'll pop in occasionally. Let's see, what do we got here? Mm. Ah, yes. <laughs> Where does the seaweed look to find a job? In the kelp wanted section? I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> that one's good. Okay, um, in between those I'll jump on to something else. Let me switch over to this. We're going to do spoke shave at 10. So 
So I'm writing these down so that later on I can put them in and have a timestamp for when everything is. So for the spoke shave, we're going to take it all apart. And thanks for the super chat. If there's ever something you want to see particularly, throw up a super chat and I'll be able to see it. So with all that taken apart and blown out, now all we have is this. So you have the lever cap and the body. Now this is one of my favorites. It's a um, Stanley number 151. Just a really nice plane. The problem with this is it's kind of hard. I, I, this one's a little bit big enough so I can do it like that. Um, and so when I do, I'm actually going to let it slide on my fingertips. Let me see how dull. Oh, wow, that one's really dull. Really, really dull. It's been a while since I've done this one. Um, so in this case, oh no, oh no, my uh, big vice grips are missing. And those ones are not going to be big enough. Well, we're going to have to do this one fully freehand then. I don't know where. I'm, oh, there they are. There's my big vice grips. Big vice grips. With these, we can clamp this down and use this as a guide. Um, and for little irons like the, the spoke shaves, that's really useful. One of my diamond stones seems to have become grooved, perhaps through misuse. Grooved? Di di wow. Um, I have never heard of one becoming grooved. Um, sounds like a cheap diamond stone, but I don't know. Um, feel free to send me pictures. I'd be glad to take a look at it. But uh, yeah, that's really odd. All right, so um, flip back over to this one. I need to set this angle up at the correct angle. Focus, there we go. So I'm gonna set this up on here and I'm gonna eyeball the angle and put the vice grip on here. And I don't want it that high, I want it a little bit lower. I want it right about there. That's where I want it to be. So I'm just gonna clamp the vice grip down. And now I have a ready-made um, angle for it. But we need to come all the way back to the coarse stone. So we're gonna do the same thing again. Window cleaner, one little spritz each. This one's probably going to need a good big grinder. I may actually to take this one back because it's pretty bad. I'm trying to put even pressure because there's a lot of pressure from this right in the middle. So my fingers are going to be on either side of it trying to put the even pressure out on those wings. Now let's wipe it off. Check it. Got scratches most of the way across. Actually, it sharpened up a good bit faster than I thought. Got a nice burr running all the way along. That lets me know we're good. Now we can move over to the fine. Getting vibration on the back drag due to the vice grip. That should be all it needs. On to the extra fine. Or I guess this is the, yeah, it's extra fine. Making sure, good burr running all the way across. We can take it out of the vice grips now. I'm gonna set it on here, roll the burr the other direction. Really only need one pass, I don't know why I keep going. Nice, so now our burr has been worked back and forth. We can strop it. Actually, this strop is getting a little bit too loaded. It's been a while since I've refilled that. So you can tell once it starts to get dark, um, that's um, the, the dark is the steel that's in there. So I'm gonna take my card scraper and I'm gonna scrape off the dark areas. And then I'll grab a honing compound. It's amazing how much faster it cuts with fresh honing compound. Uh, if I were using a much thicker nap, uh, then I would probably reapply it every time I use it. And in this case, the angle doesn't matter quite as much with this ultra hard horse butt. Um, so we can just do that. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. And go back, we're gonna go forth back and there the bird just fell off. Actually a nice long one. I don't know if you can see that running all the way across. That's happy. And we are 
We are very sharp. That's what I want. So there, there's the, uh, the spoke shave. It's pretty easy. And this goes back in, bevel down, because almost all hand planes are bevel down, with very few exceptions. Slide this back in, clamp it up, and spoke shave is done. Uh, please do card scrapers. Yeah, let's do a card scraper here. So, um, what time is it now? 15, let's move on to a card scraper. And 15, okay. So I've got this card scraper here that is, um, it's okay, but the burrs on it are all over the place and uh, uh, I just need to take it back down and clean it up. Most of the time I can, I can redo it without cleaning it up a couple times. Uh, but in this case, I want to save the, the blue color on this. So I'm gonna use a little bit of tape and run that right up the middle. And so I put a little tape on here, wrap it around, and that little bit of tape, oop, don't want a wrinkle in there, don't want the wrinkle. There we go, oh, it's still got the wrinkle. Get rid of the wrinkle. There, wrinkle free. There, now the tape will just protect it, lifts it up an ang a slight angle. Now I'm just going to be using my finest plate. There's no reason to use anything else on here. I'm gonna set it flat on here. I'm gonna put pressure all the way along this. And it's just gonna take a couple strokes. And I wanna run my finger along it and make sure that that burr is gone. It is. So we're gonna do it on this side. Just a couple strokes. And I'll move my fingers, making sure, I still got a little burr there. Yeah. So I just gotta move my fingers around so I'm putting pressure on it because it will generally only take it off where the fingers are at. Oh, still got a good, good bit more on that one. Wow. Why am I, oh, there's a bunch of junk on here, that's why. I have some schmoo running up there probably um, strop compound because I just cleaned it off of that. So I'm going to grab a junk chisel and I'm going to scrape that schmoo off. Just like that. There we go. Get rid of the schmoo. And there we go. No burr on that side. And I got a little bit right here, just right there. There you go, got rid of that burr. Do the same thing on the other side. So thanks for the super chat, Paul. Here I can let you see my body movement. I'm just sliding my fingers along it, making sure I get that out. Got a little bit of schmoo on this side too. Get rid of that. So I use two different sides to clean that compound off. And then we can rotate it over, do the fourth side. Now, if I really wanted to, I could do the ends of it, um, but I don't like working on the ends. There, we've gotten rid of the burr on all four edges of it. So I'm gonna lift it up on edge, and some people will come in with a block of wood as a jig and make sure that they keep it perfect 90 degrees. Um, I, I don't find that, I just hold it up like this, and I just hold it up like that and go at it. If the edge is ever so slightly rounded, that's not a problem at all. And there I have a nice clean edge. I want to actually look along it and make sure that my reflection moves all the way along it nice and clean, that there's no junk on it. There we look pretty good. So we've got a clean edge on this all the way across. And let me work up. Um, my bench here. Uh, actually, let's do it in the end cap. That'll make it a little bit easier. My end vise is a little easier for grabbing this. I'll do one freehand and one with the video. I uh, want in the vise because most people first starting out, the vise is much, much easier. There's that. Grab my burnisher, which is a carbide rod with an unfinished surface and I'm going to keep it 90 degrees to the plate a decent amount of pressure here 
At this point, I'm mushrooming it over and I'm squeezing out a small burr on both sides. And a little bit more. Just going until I feel an ever so slight burr. There. That's, that's enough to, to get you started, but I want to make that burr a little bit finer and a little bit lower angle. So I'm going to take this from 90 degrees and I'm going to tip it to about a 15 degree here. I'm going to start close to the handle and I'm going to end up close to the other end because I'm actually going to be pulling that out as I go across. Not a whole lot of pressure, just enough to get that burr. And do the same thing on the other side. That one needs a little more. There we go. Got a nice feeling burr running all the way along it. So that's in the vise, which is the way most people are going to do it right off the bat. The way I do it generally is, let me lift this up so you can see a little better. Which side did I just do? Just did this side, so I need to do this side. So I'll stick the corner into the bench, let it squeeze in a little ways, and I'm just going to do this. There's the initial, and then burr, burr, burr. Rotate it around. Burr, burr. Oop, need a little more. There we go. Burr, burr, burr. So let me actually test this one out for you so you can see what we're looking at. Let me grab a piece with a somewhat decent edge because we want to actually get curls off of it. We don't want. Um, off edges. I'm late. Well, no one's late. This one's going to be one of those fun ones that goes all throughout the day, probably about three or four hours worth. So on this one, I'm going to bend it a little bit, and I should get a curl with very little dust. Mm, that's actually a little more dust than I wanted. Yeah, it's a lot more dust than I wanted. Okay, so that edge, yeah, it doesn't feel as good there. Give that edge just a little bit more. Yeah, let's try that edge again. That feels better. Catching more than I want. Why am I having so much issue? Oh, <laughs> on this one I'm going against the grain, so it's popping them out, so I'm getting a little more dust because of that. So if I turn it around, let's go with the grain, I'll get a much cleaner surface on there. Got a little problem with my leather. Let's give that a try. Oh yeah, you can hear the difference. Now I'm getting curls. That's what you expect in oak. Oh, those are just happy. Nice grain. Oh, I'm on the wrong one. That's why. Huh, sorry. <laughs> Here, this is what it looks like when you go with the grain. Curls. That's what you want. But if I turn it around and I go against the grain, I'm going to get some curls, but I'm going to get more dust because you're popping the grain up. You can even hear the difference. You can still do it against the grain and you're still going to get a fairly clean cut. It's just not going to look as pretty uh, from the curl point of view. As you can see, I'm still getting some curls, but I'm also getting more dust when you go against the grain. But it still works. It just doesn't, doesn't feel as good. Always going against the grain feels bad. So there's a card scraper. Yeah, sorry about the camera view. Okay, let's go back to a plane. 
Uh, what time is it? 24. Let's do Stanley number five, Jack Plane. So on this one, let's actually bring this back over. And take her apart. So pop the lever cap off. This one has been a bit of a treat for me. Why are you stuck? Wow. Had that screw down a little tighter than it should have been. And then take it apart, pull this out. Let's see how sharp are we? Nope, you need a lot of work. So we're gonna take it all the way apart. Oop, not the chisel. <laughs> Loosen that, back it up, rotate it so that the tip of this doesn't touch the tip of that. Swing it back, and there we have our iron. Okay, this one we're going to take all the way back to the coarse stone plate, whatever you want to call it. Add one, two, three. Window cleaner, just the cheapest window cleaner out there. And now, I'm sharpening most all my planes and irons at about 30 to 35 degrees. For a bevel down plane, you don't need anything tighter angle than that. Okay, wipe it off. Check it. Yeah, that one needs a lot more work. That one's really dull. I mean, like, really dull. I'm actually going to take that one back to the extra course. I'm wondering what. Oh, that's right, because I was doing. Uh, I was planing finish off with this last time. That'd be why it's dull. <laughs> so I have an extra, extra course, or it's just extra course DMT. And I bring this out when I really need to do some work on it, and you'll hear the difference on it. Also, when you first get a new diamond plate, they are really, really aggressive, and they cut incredibly fast. But you're going to knock off a lot of the loose diamonds right off the bat, and in the first couple months, they mellow out a good bit. Um, and then they get to the same spot where they're going to be for years. Just a little more in the corner right there. You'll notice I'm not doing any of the wings. I'm not putting any camber on these. The only one I put camber on is the scrub plane. Uh, there we go. Nice burr running all the way across. So then I'm going to come back here onto the course, get rid of the scratches from the extra course. Change my angle so I can see them a little better. There we go. Fine. Fine, I'll do it. Extra fine. Change the angle one more time. If I'm noticing that the plate is starting to get dark, I just work a little bit more lubricant, a little more window cleaner over onto it. You notice I wipe them off pretty regularly as soon as they're done. There we go, got a good burr running all the way across it. So I'm gonna put it on here, get rid of that burr, and then we can bring it over onto the strop. Go one, two, three, four, five, nine, ten. Flip it over. If it's new compound, it doesn't need much at all. If it's old compound, it usually needs a few more strokes. And then we'll just go back and forth a couple times. Just like that. That's good and sharp. That's all she needs. So I put it back together, put that on, slide it back, rotate it over. Oh, I'm on the wrong camera, sorry. Rotate it over. Slide that up, I'm gonna put it with this one about a sixteenth inch away because it's not a really fine cutter. It's just number five. Tighten it down. Back it up just a hair. Oop, not that far. There we go. And then we can tighten that down. Put it back in the plane. And I'm not going to do the fine adjustment. I do that when I need it because I don't know what the next time I'm going to use this plane I'm going to need. Do I, am I going to need a really fine shaving or am I just cutting to get the cutting done? In which case then 
I can adjust it. So there we go. That's backed up and ready to go. There's number five. That one goes here, right? Nope, that one goes here. Um, let's see, what are we going to do next? Let's actually do the uh, bevel down low angle. I'm sharpening my planes and chisels. Yeah, I'm going to do saws a little later because doing saws live is really annoying. So I'm going to try and do those last um, because they get... Um, and it's really annoying to listen to. Um, but yeah. So let's take this thing apart. Come on out. Got a lot of dust in there. Put the Norris adjuster back in. I love Norris adjusters, at least a good Norris adjuster. Cheap ones, not so much, but this one is not too bad. They're just simple and easy. Now this one's 25 degrees. And so if I really wanted to be specific on it, I could come through here and put a, a gauge on it. But with this, I do it so infrequently that I'm gonna bring it back to this. But because it has a large, large bevel area, I'm gonna start with my extra coarse. Um, just because it, it cuts much quicker. Um, anything with the, the low angle, with the big bevel areas, <coughs> it just takes a little longer. So I'm going to set it on, feel that angle. And especially with the A2, they're a little bit harder. And it needs a little more work. This one's pretty dull. Some of the problems with the 25 degree angles is that they dull so quickly. Even with A2, that's far more durable. Um, it just, I, one of the reasons why I don't like low angle planes is that you have to sharpen them so much more often and they get dull so much faster. Whereas with you, do a normal plane at 30, 35 degrees, it stays sharp forever. Okay, there, got a nice burr running all the way across it. On to, whoop, the lubricant. Doesn't take much, just a little bit. Work it around, give that bevel. One. Two, three, there we go. Nice scratches, rotate the bevel back the other way. There we go. Then onto the strop. Flip it over, rotate it again. go. Nice, keen, sharp edge. You can feel it grabbing every grain on the thumb. That's what I'm looking for. So let's put this sucker back together. <sighs> bevel up. Feels so weird to put a plane in bevel up. When I first got started, I thought every plane was bevel up because that just makes sense, right? But then after becoming a hand tool person, uh, no, bevel up just feels weird. Tighten that down and there we go. Another one done. Uh, put this back. Oop, let me do that. Low angle jack. And that was at, oh, uh, what time? We were 33, so that was probably sometime around 28. I'll have to go back and check that one. Uh, let's see, what are we doing next? Um, you know what? Let's do a traditional wooden spoke shave. These are weird. Wooden spoke. So on this one, this is one I made what five or six years ago. Um, maybe we should catch up on these, make sure. Uh, could you do a draw knife? I might do a draw knife a little bit later. So on these ones, this is just set in um, with some spurs that go through and it's just friction fit. It's one of my favorite simple designs. Used to be able to find them all the time, uh, but they're harder and harder to find. Just gonna drive it out. There's my iron. And one of the things I love about wooden um, hand planes is they're naturally a rounded body. Even though the bottom of this is flat, um, the sole is rounded. 
<coughs> so pull this out and the two bevels on these, um, one is up in here and the other one is perfectly flat all the way across there. Let's see, how sharp are we? We're pretty dull. Um, and so unless I need to do some cleanup on this, I generally don't do the backside. Um, I'll focus on the, the bevel. Um, so in this case, I'm going to have to pop these out. And I'm going to put, actually, I'm just going to go ahead and pop them all out now while I'm doing it. Pop out. Pop out. And then I'm going to put this towel on the edge and then set this over right there on the, the edge itself. Let me turn this so you guys can see a little bit better. So I'm going to set this on here and I'm going to feel its angle right about there. Put just a little bit of lube here. And let me see if I can zoom in a little bit better. There we go. Set this on there. Feel its bevel. And this finger underneath is actually riding on the side of the plate. That's kind of being my, my guide. And so I can pinch it on there and run it on here. Now the problem is I'm only putting pressure here in the middle where my thumb's at. So sometimes I'm bringing my other fingers, put pressure over here. And then we're going to see how are we doing? How are the scratch marks on it? And the scratch marks are looking pretty good. I have a burr there and there, but not over here. So a little bit more. I want to get that burr running all the way across. There we go. Nice burr all the way across. So that plate is done. Wipe it off, set it aside. Go on to the fine. Fine. Oop. That should be all it needs. Wipe it off. Set it aside. Go on to the extra fine. You may have noticed that there is a pretty standard here. Boom, boom, boom. Once you get the burr turned or developed with the coarse stone, then the others go much, much quicker. You don't spend as much time on the fine and extra fine. Ooh, just shaved a chunk off my thumb. Got a little too close to the edge. And then got our burr on there, so we're going to flip it over this way. And I'm just going to take that burr off. Roll it over onto the other side. One more pass. Still got just a hair back here. This one is generally they're designed to be slightly rounded. Um, so they're not perfectly flat across. So you have to do them from one angle all the way on to the other angle. I didn't spend quite as much back here. There we go. Got rid of the burr all the way across there. Now I can take it over here onto the strop. The problem is I can't strop on this one. Here, I put these back in because the strop is ooh, screwed on. So in that case, I grab a loose strop, add a little bit of compound on that, and I'm going to slide that over onto the edge of my plate. So just like I did before, uh, except for I need to raise it up just a little bit so those spurs get down. So just like we did before with the edge on here, and I'm going to go... there and then on there yeah, really close that one's almost off there we go oh I love it when you can just feel it grabbing that's what we want. Then to reinstall it, this slides in here and you work it down close to the depth. Oop. Grab a mallet, mallet, uh, little, little plane adjusting mallet. And there we go. 
Another one's ready to go. Oh, sorry, it's on the wrong one. Plane adjusting mallet. Tap, 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 tap. Can't remember which one I'm on. Bought a set of spoke shaves for restoration. One I've never seen before is a convex. Um, um, I think you're saying, meaning concave. Um, the concave ones, I never use mine. Um, they're just, I don't know, I found them to be kind of pointless unless I did a lot of spokes. Um, here's one. Uh, so it has the, the concave shape on there. Um, I just don't use it. I, I actually prefer to use a flat when doing um, rounded shapes because it gives me a little more control. They're just, yeah, I don't see a huge reason for the, the concave versions. Um, I've never seen one with a convex iron across the iron. Um, I've seen, you know, rounded body planes, but uh, yeah. April Fool's video of you sharpening a saw with a plate two inches above the vise. Yeah. <laughs> Creek! Creek! That would be a fun video. <laughs> a little vindictive in that nature. I like it. Um, okay, uh, next let's go on to doing, ooh, little number three. Um, I don't use a number three that much, but they are really nice for smoothers. Where are we at? 41. So, let's take this one apart and go to town on that. Are you putting a micro bevel on your planes or just keep it at 25 degrees? Um, most of my planes are at um, 35 degrees except for the bevel up. Um, and I don't put any secondary bevel on them. They're just flat. Okay, that one, that one's actually not that bad. It's, it's still a little dull, um, but it's not quite as sharp as I would want for a smoothing plane. And it's not quite at the point where I just take it to the strop. So I'm not going to go all the way back to the course. I'm just going to start with the fine. So this one should be pretty quick. Look at the scratch marks. There aren't any. Cool. So I'm going to set the angle I want, about 30, 35 degrees. The actual angle doesn't matter that much. I put it somewhere between 30, 35, sometimes up to 40. For bevel down plane, that's all it needs. I need a little more. Huh. Oh, I know why. This one was last time sharpened in um, one of the plane iron tests. Um, and I sharpened this one to, I think it was 40 degrees, so I actually have to do a little work to bring this back down to something a little less. So once they get up around 40 degrees, I want to bring them back to like a 35. 40 degrees means you only have 5 degrees of, of relief, which is okay, um, but I like to have a little bit more, especially for a smoothing plane where I might want to start in the middle of a board. So, let's just bring this one back to about 35. You can see I'm not actually checking anything. I just, my hand knows where about 35 is. This will take a little bit more work than normal. Almost there. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. That onto the fine, uh, extra fine. plates off and then we strop. That's why this one wasn't terribly dull because the last time I used it was actually in the plane iron test which tells you how long it has been since I used a number three. Don't use them very often. That's what I want. Really nice. Pleasing. Then put this on here 90 degrees. Slide it back, 
rotate in so that the tip doesn't touch the tip. Lock that down. On this one I want it a little bit closer, something like a 32nd or a 64th. Because it is a good smoothing plane, so I want to have that chip connection. And then tighten it down on there. Put this on. Slide it in. Again, I'm going to back up the iron so it's not where it should be. Actually, that one is backed up already. That lets me know I need to adjust it next time I use it. Put that back on the board. Yay! Uh, with the plane you use most is the number four or something. I use about the four and the five pretty close to interchangeably. Um, they're, they're very similar um, in how often I use them. Uh, let's do a scrub plane. I haven't sharpened this one in almost two years. Uh, UB46. So scrub plane is the one that I actually camber. Uh, so this one needs a bit more funk in the work, but because it's been so long, I'm going to have to take it back. You can see how much of a camber I have in there. If I remember correctly, it's about an 8-inch radius. Take the chip breaker off. That screw has seen better days. Take that apart, set it down. And now, let's slide back over to the extra course. Yay! Ooh, Thor is coming down the stairs. Okay. So with this one, because it's been so long, it's got to come back here. And I'm going to start on one wing, and as I push forward, I'm going to rotate to the other. And as I bring it back, I'm going to bring it back. That gives me an X on the plate, and then I'll do it the other direction. It gives me an X the other way. So it starts up on this wing. And once I get, I don't do this very often, so I kind of get myself into the rhythm. And then once I get into the rhythm, then I go both ways. Don't do it in the hole. Check my scratch patterns. Yeah, those are looking pretty good. This one's got a few chips in it, but not bad. Scrub planes don't have to be pretty, unless you actually want that scrub plane finish look. They just take a little bit more work. And if I want to change the scratch pattern make when I do, I can set it up on this and go back to front, rocking it side to side. That way I can see one scratch pattern against the other. A little more. Just a little more. Scrub planes don't have to be great. This one's got a pretty decent chip in it right there, which I could spend some time and grind out, but in this case, it's not really needed. So I'm just going to go until I have a pretty heavy burr. strokes and I'll call it good. There we go. So then on to the course. Fine and extra fine. And usually, actually last time I did it that way, so I'm going to Switch up the method I use every other. So that each plate I can see different scratch patterns in there. Here, let me show you a close up on this. You can see really wild scratch patterns on there because I'm halfway in between the two. So half of them are going end to end, half of them are going across. That's what I'm playing with. And I want to go until I get one scratch pattern all the way across the tip. 
There's that one. So then let's move on to this one. Again, I'm going to change my angle so that I'm getting a different out of focus, different scratch pattern on this one. And I'm very careful about the scratch patterns on this one because it's hard to see if you've done every spot along the camber without them. And then on to the last one. One more, one big one, one big one. There, let me show you this one again. You gonna focus on it or not? There we go. See the scratch pattern going all the way across that from side to side. You got a pretty heavy burr all the way along. So get rid of that burr. We're going to go onto its back. And then, with the scrub plane, it really doesn't matter with the bur with the uh, the strop, but eh, it makes me feel good. So I'm gonna do a few strokes on there, one side and the other, and then that's nice and sharp. That'll give me a nice clean edge, except for that one chip. I've got one. Here, let me show. See if I can focus on that. And let you see that one chip. There's that. Uh, let's see where is it? It's right, right here where my fingernail is at. One big chip right there, and it'd take a little while to grind that out. It really doesn't matter for a scrub plane, so I'm just going to leave that in there. I know it's really going to drive a lot of people bonkers that I'm going to leave a chip in the edge of the eye for a scrub plane. Oh well, um, unless I was you gonna, unless I was going to use this to actually get that that scalloped scrub plane look as a finished surface, then I would spend more time on it. But for standard scrub plane, it doesn't make a lick of difference. And I'm going to put this in um, with a good bit of iron sticking out here because I don't need the chip breaker to be all that amazing. I'm actually going to break back it up a little bit. So it's about a sixteenth inch from the corners, but I'm probably, what, three sixteenths away at the middle? Maybe almost a quarter. It's a pretty decent distance back. Tighten this down, lock it in. Let's check some comments. Uh, uh, yeah, you can send me an email, Amanda. Um, send me some pictures on there. My email is on the About tab on, on uh, the channel page, or you can find the Contact Me page on my website. Um, and once I respond to that, you can send me a picture. Go in, pop in, there we go. Why are you so loose? This is my cheapest number five. And I actually have a video from this, like, five or six years ago putting the camber on this with some sandpaper on the ground and uh, yeah there scrub plane all done let's see what's next let's do uh, let's do my four and a quarter um, I use this just about as often as I use uh, my number three but the last time I used this it was um, well here actually I'm gonna do some other maintenance on this other than that because this one actually has um, some marks that's not rust um, that's actually uh, junk left on it because I was taking some finish off with it. So we're going to clean that off as well as sharpening the iron. So first thing is, take this out. Let me do this. 53. Uh, four and one quarter. 53. So take this apart. I really don't like those. I know a lot of people like the kidney. I'm not a big fan of it. I'm going to take this off. Pull it off. I'm going to bring out my extra course. And... Just gonna clean it off. I know this is really gonna drive a lot of people crazy. That it's not the full length of it. It's not perfectly flat. Oh well, I'm just cleaning the bottom. Just getting rid of those marks. And if you look at it, you can see really shiny here, really shiny here. A little bit dull there. I'm still getting some scratches. Uh, but there's a bit of a, a valley running all the way along the middle. And that's perfectly okay for this. I don't use this as a, as a fine smoothing plane. So I'm just going to do the extra course on here and just using that to clean it up a little bit. I don't go any more than that. That's all it needs right there. 
So I'm not flattening it out, so I'm not really worrying about everything. Oh, a lot of people are going to ask, what is up with this hole in the toe? You're going to find that in a lot of planes, and it really doesn't look factory because it went right through the Stanley logo. And that is there so you can hang it up on a pegboard. Yeah, a lot of planes um, that were used in the late 60s through um, late 80s, um, you find with a hole there that people would use to hang on a peg or a hook. And uh, just kind of bugs a lot of collectors. If there's a hole in it, the collector value of the whole thing is basically zero because they hate them. And for me, it's like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change a thing in how it works. So let's get back to the iron. On the iron here, crack it open. Oop. Slide it back, keep it away from the tip. Rotate it 90 degrees and pop it out. This is another one that I used in the plain iron test, and it's a hock iron. Um, and that one needs a good bit of work, but I think we'll just take it back to the, the coarse plate. So spray, spray, spray. Set it on here, lift it up. Why is that plate up so high? Put that one back down a bit. There we go. Oh, I must have some junk underneath. It's seesawing. <laughs> Won't change anything for how I use it, but I probably got to clean out this. I haven't really cleaned this um, holder since I made it. So let's see. Yeah, this one is in the plain iron test, so it's at a pretty high angle, but I'm going to redo it at a high angle. So it's going to be at like 40 degrees, be like 39 I can work it down to. Yeah, it was actually pretty quick. Got a burr in the middle. I still need a little bit more on the wings. There, I got a nice burr all the way across. Onto the fine. There we go, nice scratches. Skew it a little bit, get some different scratches on it with extra fine. If I'm missing any questions, go ahead and throw them in there again, um, or throw up a super chat. I can see those. Uh, it's just a little more difficult to read. Let me make sure. Yeah, not four and a quarter, five and a quarter. <laughs> Sorry, he, he say five and a quarter, not a four and a quarter. I never made a four and a quarter. Um, Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of different ways to sharpen and you can talk to people about sharpening all day long and if you talk to 10 people you'll find 11 different methods of sharpening and they're all the right method to use. There is no right or wrong to it as long as it gets sharp in the end and you're safe, it's good. Back and forth, just like on all the others. And then we feel it. Actually, it doesn't feel that sharp. Why is it a little dull? It's okay, but it's not where I'd want it to be. It's smoother. It's probably it's somewhere around uh, 160. I want to get it down to like 120. So I'm going to take this back to the fine. Actually, I might need to clean this off again. Just put some new compound on it. I'm going to do it on the extra fine here. Just get that burr back. A little bit more. All but that side. There we go. I got that burr all the way back. Put it on here. Pull it back. Actually, let's clean this off. I'm going to use a cheapo unsharpened card scraper. Clean off this. And I usually clean this off every six or seven sharpenings. Um, anytime it gets dark, we reapply. And that bright green lets you know it's got really good charging on there. And now it doesn't take much at all to really hone that down. Give it a nice edge. Yay, there's what I'm looking for. Just 
grabs every little thread. It's one of those feelings that you can't really explain, but once you know what sharp is, it, uh, it feels good. Now, because I use this more for, I don't use this quite as much for smoothing, but I do use it for a little more spot cleanup. I'm gonna put it in a 16th inch or a little bit closer, right to the edge. Tighten that down. Oop. Don't let it slide. Come on, move with me. There we go. Lock it down, put it back in, and she is good to go. Let's see, what questions am I missing? James did a video about Virtus Mark II system. Well, uh, yes. Uh, you know, sandpaper glued to a glass is one of the quickest and easiest ways to get into sharpening. In the long run, it's more expensive because sandpaper does add up pretty quickly. Um, but when you just need to get going, it works fantastically. I did that for a long time. Uh, what method do you like the best? Oh, Richard Garrow. I trust that. Yeah, a sharpening guide is a great way to um, get started and you, you can start to feel what angle you're at. Um, but once you get once you get decent at it, it's amazing how much faster this is rather than setting up the sharpening guide every time. It just takes so long to do that. Um, next I'm going to do a skewed um, dovetail plane. And what time is it? Oh, one. Um, and for this one, um, what I'm going to do before I do anything else, I might have a video on making this one. Um, so actually, it's a series of lives, if I remember correctly. Um, really, really simple plane for making dovetails. Um, but the iron is, is skewed on here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to feel it. And I'm going to see it's a little bit higher here on the tip than it is back here. So when I'm sharpening, I'm just going to put a little bit more pressure up here than I am back here. But this lets me know where I need to take off more, where I need to take off less. So let's take this apart. Here. Wiggle out, come on. Oh, this one's wedged in there. Holy cow. Okay, let's have fun with this. Nice thing is if you break the wedge, you can make another one. <laughs> Clean out all the junk that got stuck in there. Come on. There's the plain body and wedge. And we've got our iron ready to go. Now, for the iron, I needed to take off a little bit more of the tip. But this one isn't too far off. It's actually pretty decent. Um, so on this one, I'm just going to start with my fine. And a lot of people really worry about skews, but they're the exact same thing because the edge is straight across. And so I'm going to set it on here. I'm going to do my exact same thing with the amount of pressure on here, but I'm going to put a little bit more pressure on the tip because it was off just a hair. So I want to take off just a little bit more on that tip. And then we're going to rub it off, see what we get. And a little more. There you go, now we're getting straight cuts. Don't quite have the burr I want. You may notice that I change my grip occasionally. This grip, having my thumb on here, allows me to put a lot more pressure down into it. So if I'm starting to get, if I'm starting to get impatient, that's the, usually the way I'm gonna switch to. But having it back like this gives me a little more control over where I put the pressure. There we go, nice burr all the way across. There's a little bit more burr up at the tip, which is where I want it to be, and a little less tip, a little less back here at the heel. On to the extra fine. If someone has something particular they want to see me sharpen, let me know. And if I don't see your question, go ahead and throw it back in the chat. I'll uh, 
I, I usually read the, the bottom five or six after each sharpening, unless there's a super chat that'll pop for that. There we go, nice and clean, set it on its back. Just remove that burr, or round the burr over the other way, so now I can feel the burr on the bevel side. So then we slide over to the strop, and it's starting to sound familiar. This is the way you sharpen everything. One side, onto the back. And I know I'm going to get the question of um, why am I not actually testing these when I use them? Because once you've been doing it for a while, you know what sharp feels like, and there's no reason to test it. Um, I know that this will work well, and so next time I use it, then I'll do all my setup on here. So on this one, I'm going to slide it back so that the iron, actually I'm going to move it forward and just make sure it feels good. Yeah, see that's what I'm looking for. I'm getting right about the same amount of grab all the way along this. Um, so I'm going to put this in here, I'm going to back the iron up so it's not sticking out at all. Slide my wedge in, tap it down on, and there, that one's ready to go back up on the shelf. Let's see, what questions did I miss? Woodworker often, then sharpening skills. Yeah. You know, I've heard people say that they've ruined a diamond plate using too much pressure, and I don't understand that. Um, you know, if you get like the extra coarse and you know these really really coarse plates, um, you'll occasionally get um, chip out. Like this one has um, plating missing from the middle here. That's not from putting too much pressure. That's just from um, bad adhesion of the plate. They sent me a new one and they said keep that one so I still use this one because it works okay. Um, but for these other ones um, the coarse will wear out a little faster but the fine and the extra fine those are just about lifetime and I've put a crazy amount of pressure into those and never had any issue with it so I'm kind of interested to, to learn about someone saying they put too much pressure into it. So Do something boring like bits. Okay fine who wants to do an, a wood owl? Uh, those are going to be different. Uh, so I've got my, my regular auger bit. Let's do W-O-D. Uh, what time is it? 07. 107. Let's move on to a wood owl bit. Um, let's get one that you can actually see that actually needs a little sharpening. Let's do this one. Yeah, that one looks good. So this one is my 15 sixteenths. And I'm going to be using my regular um, <sighs> auger file. There's the word. And so an auger file is, here, let me show you this. Here, focus. Come on, focus on me. Here we go. So an auger file has this weird diamond shape. And you'll see how there's teeth on this face here but there are no teeth on this face. And then you roll on its edge and there's no teeth on this one and there are teeth on this one. So you have safe sides every other side. Uh, so this allows you to do larger faces and smaller faces. So for the wood owls, normally with an auger bit, you come... Here, it makes you grab an old one. Um, because with these ones, you don't want to file the top. You want to only file the underneath. And so I'm going to use this on here. I'm going to set it at the angle it needs. And I'm going to sharpen this one. With a regular auger, it just sharpens like that. I'm going to check my scratch pattern. I'm good up there. I have a little burr sticking off. Do the same thing on the other side. Check the scratch pattern. Good. A little burr sticking up there. And then for the spurs or the knickers, I'm going to put this on here and I'm just going to do this side. And so what this is going to allow me to do is the side with the file is going to sharpen and the side without the file where it's running against something that shouldn't be sharpened, it's not going to hit that at all. Rotate around, do the other one. And I'm just watching the scratch pattern on it, waiting until it disappears. 
feel a little burr on the outside. I'm never doing the outside of this burr because that will change the diameter of this. And I'm never doing the top of this because it's hard not to hit the spur. The problem is with a wood owl, um, they're rounded flutes, so you can't come underneath them like that. Um, they're just not designed to be sharpened like that. These are actually designed to be sharpened on the top face. So with this, I'm going to use this one. Actually, let me zoom in way in on this. There we go. I'm going to set this on top of here. And these are actually initially cut with a concave shape. So I'm going to be touching right here on the back and right along that front. I want to make sure there's scratches running all the way along that front. That's all we need. Ow, stabbed myself. There we go, all the way along the front. Oops, sorry, going out of frame. Scratches all the way along the front. And then with the spurs, I'm going to rotate it again. And just sharpen those up again. Not, again, I'm not going to do the outside. They don't take much at all. And there we go. Really nice sharp spurs. That's all the wood owl needs. And this one is ready to go. You'll see this clogging on here where all this junk is stuck up in here. That happens when your spurs are dull. So if you ever see this happening, that means you've got to sharpen these. Um, so let me actually grab this. Stick an awl in here. All that junk is down in there. Need something even sharper. Um, just a second. Let me grab... Where'd my card file go? File card. Huh. Well, here. Let's use these. These are nice and sharp. These are the... Uh, um, uh, rose reproductions and beautiful, beautiful pieces, but I'm using them for something they're not intended for. Just going to clean that junk out of there. And so next time I use it, this should work perfectly. So a lot of people wonder why, if they clean out all this junk, why does it keep clogging back up? And it's because they're not sharp. You got to come back and sharpen the blades. If the blades aren't sharp, the snail will clog up. There we go. That one's ready to be used. Okay. Let's see. Um, bow saw blade, if you have one. Uh, what, uh, what type of bow saw blade? If you can let me know, J167. I've got, um, I have turning saw, I have a coping saw, um, I've got uh, my um, um, continental style um, joinery saw. I'm going to be doing saws a little later, but if you want me to, I can do one of those. Let me know which one and I'll add it to the list. I don't think any of them need to be sharpened, but I can do a little demonstration on that. The nice thing is they're, they're sharpened the exact same way as any other, um, just with a turning saw. Uh, well, with turning saw and coping saw, those are disposable blades. Um, you, yeah, you're not going to be able to sharpen those in any consistent way because there's no way to hold on to them. Um, and so those, I'm not going to sharpen them. Those just get thrown away. But if we're talking about the, the continental, um, like this one, this one is just, um, this one's just a ripping saw. So it's the exact same as I would for my big frame saw um, or as I would for my large hand saw. Um, it's just a, uh, a rip cut blade. So I will be covering this or something similar to it in a little bit. Um, but because it's an inch and a half, there's more than enough meat I can grab onto and use it in a normal saw vise. But if you're talking about the turning saw or the coping saw, um, these, um, they're disposable blades. You don't, uh, you don't sharpen these. But, uh, and if you look at some of the old, old turning saws, um, it's very, you, you don't find blades that small um, just because they were almost impossible to make without a, a, a tool. Um, you find ones that are about a quarter inch or more. Um, and a quarter inch or more, you can generally hold on to those. If you have a good saw um, sharpening vise, you can hold on to that and sharpen them a couple times before they have to be thrown away. Um, but generally, um, you didn't, uh, didn't sharpen those. Um, but if you have a specific, let me know and I'll come back to it. Let's see, there was another one here. Roger Tubbs, if you can get to it, can you do a draw knife? 
Let's do a draw knife. Uh, let's see, which one of these needs some work? You need some work. So here, this draw knife needs it. Um, I don't sharpen them that much because I don't use draw knives that much. If I had a shave horse, I probably would. Uh, but what time is it? 14. Draw knife. Uh, 115. Right, writing down the times so that people can see them later. Um, so, with this, I'm going to take my plates and I'm going to use my coarse. I'm going to use my fine, my extra fine, I'll pop them out. And uh, there's a bunch of ways to do this. You can actually sharpen it just like you would with a, an axe. Um, where is my sharpening puck? So, the drawer dumped out. Um, I don't have my sharpening puck. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm going to do it the exact same way as this. A sharpening puck is a disc. It looks like a hockey puck with a coarse grit on one side and a finer grit on the other. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to take this and put it into my, my chest, kind of like a violinist, just lower, um, and then grab a plate. And I'll show you this a little closer up in a moment here. I'm going to set this on there at the right angle, on the bevel side, not the flat side. And I can go back and forth across. And I'm looking at the scratches and matching up the cut as it goes. And I can go up and down. Usually I find myself doing the swirl pattern the most. And I'm just going until I get that scratch pattern running all the way across. So let me see if I can set up the camera to get you a closer view of this. Because actually seeing the scratch pattern develop is very um, interesting and uh, kind of fun. So I'm going to put this... Something like that. I mean, you should be able to get this. So, yeah, let's zoom in on that. Back up to here. There we go. There. You should be able to see the scratch pattern developing on there. And so I'm going to set this on here. Here, over here, you can see, I don't know if you can see, ah, oh, there we go. You can see that those darker spots are where I haven't been touching. This shiny spot here means I'm getting a good scratch pattern all the way across there. So I'm just going to work a little bit more over here. And now I'm getting more shiny down here. I've got one little dark spot right here, but it's right on the tip, so I might not worry about that. Or I might just focus a little bit on that. I've ever sharpened this one particularly, and I've got a decent little burr on the back side all the way across there. Pretty heavy burr right here because I spent more time over there. So I'm actually going to do a little bit more to get a little heavier burr. You can tell I'm not using any fluid on this. Um, with it having gravity, the dust tends to fall off pretty easily. With it having gravity. <laughs> There's that. Then let's move on to the fine. We're going to do the same thing on this one. Now on this one, I'm probably going to change it up so that I can see the scratch pattern develop a little better. And I'm trying to move the plate up and down rather than just having it in one spot. I move it up a little bit, do a few strokes here, do a few strokes here. That way I'm using different spots of the plate. go. Move on to this one. Now with draw knives there's hundreds of different ways of doing it and different people are going to have different things that they like and so you're going to see different methods from different gurus with different tools. It's one of those things that you can sharpen a thousand different ways. And, oh have I been on the wrong camera the whole time? Oh I'm so sorry. <laughs> Here, let me switch over to this camera so you can actually see what's going on here. Um, yeah, sorry about that. So, scratch patterns over here. Actually, let me take it back to the course so you can see. Let 
So most of the time I'm doing either that swirl pattern or going back and forth. Here we go. And then one more time. This is what you can see on the plate. Here, let me back it up. I don't know if you can see. I've got a few more um, marks here from where I've been doing it, so I'm going to do the other end of the second half. And then before I use them, I'm just going to wipe them off again because they've gotten a little bit onto them. Just like that. And then uh, for the strop, um, I mean, there's a bunch of different ways. Either I could glue this to a plate and I could do the exact same thing. Usually, uh, where did it go? I grab a, there it is, a block of wood. And I'll put that into the vise. There we go. And I'll just put a loose bit on here. Move the junk away. It's easier if I do it the other way. <laughs> Except for the camera's in my way that way. Because it doesn't take that much at all to do it up. Then just remove the burr. And there we go. That's what I'm looking for. Actually, I still have a little bit of a burr back over here on this side. Yeah. So actually, I'm going to take my finest stone, set it on here flat. Just a little bit like that. That rolled the burr over that way. That's pleasant. So now it's really nice. I can set it on here. Trying to get little tiny shavings, just letting it dip where I can really crank it in. I can take out some big shavings. Oop. Except for I'm holding this. I really need to make a, a shave horse sometime. <laughs> Oh, I was on the wrong camera again. <laughs> uh, wish my wife was here because then she would say, hey, you're on the wrong camera. Okay, um, so there's a draw knife. Did I have another super chat? I thought I did. Let me go back and check a look at that. So if there's something you want to see me do, let me know. Uh, oh, thanks. Join the member. Yeah, I need my wife down here. But she has been unbelievably crazy at work right now. It's just been absolutely off the charts. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hospitals right now, not the place you want to be. Um, so, yes. Let's see. Course. Yeah, where is, which one is this? This one's fine. And this one's extra fine, right? Extra fine. All right, let's see. What's next? Um, still have a bottle of Windex. <laughs> yes. Uh, how about a marking knife? Oh, yeah, I can do a marking knife. Um, Okay, let's see what we got. We're at 24. One, 24. So, uh, my marking knife, the, the, it is a single bevel, double-edged, um, which confuses a lot of people to think that it's a double bevel, but it only has one bevel on each edge. It just happens to have two edges. Um, we'll get this all. I'm actually clean up this so I'm not running into things so much. Put the bits back where they need to go. 
those back. I don't need those anymore right now. And that away. Okay, so bevel edge. Um, this is my marking knife, and it has uh, one bevel on each side, but it has two sides, two edges. <laughs> Thanks, Don, <laughs> for self esteem after figuring the cameras. Yeah, I know. <laughs> ah, oh well. <sighs> you think I would know because there's a big blinking light here in front of me that says, hey, change it over. And then, yeah. <laughs> there's a reason I married my wife. She's really good at telling me, hey, I'll fix that. Uh, cool. So let's do this. Um, the, the double bevel on here. Um, I'm going to bring it over here and I'm going to start with my coarse plate. And with this one, where did my Windex go? There it is. I'm going to go squirt, squirt, squirt. I'm going to set it up on here. Actually, let's move that up just a hair. There we go. I'm going to set this on here. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to have one finger up the tip, one finger back here. And then I can rotate with my fingers back here between my thumb and my middle finger. Actually do the rotation. And so I'm going to set it on here. And I actually, mine, if you look at it really closely, I don't have a consistent straight bevel. Mine are almost always cambered. Um, I don't, I don't know. It's just one of those things that I like having that shape that's rounded. Um, so it, rather than being perfectly straight on the other side, because the only thing you use is the very, very, very tip. It's rare that you're using anything back here. Um, so the only thing that's really important is the, is the, is the actual tip. Uh, so focus. There we go. Bring it back here. And I'm going to just loosey-goosey sharpen this like that. Feel for that burr. Wherever I don't have the burr, that's what I'm going to work on a little bit more. Got the burr on that side. Then we'll rotate it. So rather than being on this edge, I'm just going to rotate it and do the exact same thing I did, the exact same grip. Just rotate it between my thumb and forefinger, middle finger. Just like that. A little bit more on that one. Because the other plates are getting in the way, I'm going to roll it back. And again, I'm going to look at the scratch pattern on it. And I'm going to see that I get that scratch pattern running all the way across the side. If I come back on this side, you can see there's no scratch pattern from here where my nail is back to the back, but there's a scratch pattern from there up. So I want to get that scratch pattern all the way back, and I want to get a burr all the way back on there. Oop. Loss of signal. There we go. Need a little more fluid. There we go. A little more. Okay, now I've got that burr running all the way across. Let's go up here and here. Same thing here. a little less. Check the scratch patterns. Same thing over here. Some people wonder why I don't wipe it off um, in between switching from one to the other. Um, and that's really important for um, natural and synthetic stones, but it's not important for diamonds because diamonds you're not going to be carrying one grit from one plate to the other. Um, that's something that's just with uh, natural stones. And then bring it over here to the strop. And Pretty straightforward. Actually, I'm going to get rid of the burr on the back here. Just roll it over here. And I'm going one direction, and then going the other direction, and back. A little bit on here. One side and then the other. Then on the other side, the other edge. And there we go. Nice, sharp marking knife. So there's my marking knife. Uh, do you know what's the difference between a bevel inside and a bevel outside gouge? Um, if the bevel is inside, it's called an in-cannel gouge. If the bevel is on the outside, it's called a gouge. Um, <laughs> um, in-cannel gouges are really well known uh, for being used by pattern makers. 
um, they're great for referencing a surface and can, carrying that surface all the way across. So if you need to transfer from one piece of wood that's been nailed onto another piece of wood, you can shave off and get a really smooth transfer. So in cantle gouges are great for that. Um, in general carving, there aren't a whole lot of uses for them. Um, and so you don't see them very often in carving sets. I mean, they are there because there are some uses. Um, but most of the time you're just using a regular standard gouge uh, for carving. Mm. Uh, but a lot of old pattern makers had um, in candle gouges. Uh, Eastern Maryland, hey. Thanks for all the great animals. Well, thank you, Richard. Um, actually, I think I need to do another dad joke. Do I need to put my book? Ah, oh, here it is. There's been several super chats and I haven't done one. Usually my wife is looking at that, but you know where Richard's at. I want to. <laughs> no, that one's not appropriate. <laughs> Who is the patron saint of emails? Who is the patron saint of emails? Um, I already forgot it. I guess that's half the joke. Saint Francis of CC. <laughs> I like that one. CC. Okay, let's do a uh, let's do a four and a half. Big wide iron, a little bit different. Four and one half. And we are at 1031. So 131. I think in about 20, 30 minutes, I'm going to transition over to doing saws. Um, so stay tuned for the creak, creak, creak. I'm going to try and do everything but saws until then so I can put up the saw vise and just do the saws at once. Uh, so in this case, let's open this up. up. Um, and let's crack this apart. So lever cap, pull it out. I don't use my four and a half as much people do as a lot of people do. Um, it's one that I grab when my four or my five is dull. Um, I just don't like the wider plane in a standard use as much. But uh, a lot of people like it, just not me. Uh, James, the blue dye you have on your planes, is that rust prevention? Um, no, actually, if the planes are blue, they're ones that I have completely restored. The Japaning was, was really, really bad, and so I stripped them off and repainted them. Um, I do that to planes that, number one, I restore for my own personal use. Um, so if I'm restoring it for someone else or for historical purpose, I have Japaning I can redo on them, or um, I usually leave them alone. But if it's my own personal use, the blue makes me happy, and so I paint them blue. So let's take this apart. And we got an iron here, and it's not too bad. It's actually pretty decent. Just need to do a little more work on it. So we're going to start on the fine and go up from there. I don't need to take it back to the course because it's not that bad. Let's get develop some scratch patterns on here. And with the wider irons, it's very important that I have more fingers on here. Three, or sometimes all four, putting even pressure. If I notice that it's out of square one way or the other, I'm never going to bring a square in and check it, but if it's visually out of square, then I'm going to be putting more pressure on the side that's longer. And I may actually put two or three fingers all on one side or all on the other. Um, but generally, I'm going to bring in a stash of them. A stash of fingers. Lock in at the angle I want. You see all that black coming off? That is iron. Scratch pattern looks nice and clean all the way across. A very light burr, except for right in the middle. I need a little bit more right in the middle. Hmm. Got a good burr out on either side, but not in the middle yet. So let's wipe this off, add a little bit more, since we're starting to get a lot on there. Now I'm just going to put two fingers right in the middle. Give that a try. There we go, light burr all the way across. Do the same thing over here. Scratch patterns look good. Yeah, it needs just a hair more. It's not right up at the tip, it's just back a tiny bit. There we go. 
Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. I've got this little burr that's flipping back and forth. So I can set it on here. Just do a little bit. Take it over to the strop. Okay, the next one, I have to clean the strop again. And then we'll go back and forth. One, two, one, two, one, two. Yeah. That's what I'm looking for. Got that nice grab on the finger. One of those things that's kind of hard to tell over video, but you start to know and feel what truly sharp is. And that's sharp. It's not incredibly crazy sharp because I don't use this for smoothing. Um, but on the normal sharpness scale that I'd use, I'm guessing it would end up somewhere around uh, 140, 150. I could probably get this down to around 100, but generally anything under 140 is only going to last you 20, 30 strokes, even with the best of irons. We're going to put this in here, lock it down, and there's the four and a half. Not the four and a quarter, <laughs> for those of you who were earlier. That's a little loose. Let's tighten that one up a little bit. That's feel better. We're going to back the iron up, because when I first sharpen them, I'm not going to do the full adjustment. Well, that one is sticking out a good ways. And I back them up to let me know I still need to do the adjustment on them. So there's that one. Let's see, what's next? Um, still have a... Uh, our teeth of plain stop also sharpened. Yeah, if you want to. Um, I don't usually do mine. You don't need to be crazy sharp. Unless you want them to be crazy sharp, then you could. What is the temp in Russia if you're still here? Oh, sorry. Just purchased a 15, I just purchased 15 number four planes to restore. Ooh, that sounds like a fun time. Okay, cool. Let's move on. So I've got a, uh, actually, let's do a block plane. Um, this is just a really cheap nine and a half, and I use it quite a bit. I've got, um, I've got, it was 61 that I really like and I'd like to restore, um, but I, it's in parts right now, and it's one that's, I think it's been in parts for like three or four years now. Um, block plane. B L O C K. E, and what time is it? 37. 37. All right, so for the block plane, let's take this apart. Lever cap, flip it over, pull it out, and we have a bevel up iron. What in the world? That it's bevel up. Ah. Um, you don't see bevel ups that often in hand planes. Yeah, it's one of those interesting things that we think of bevel up as being uh, it was a really great plane, but it just didn't exist back in the day. Well, I mean, it did, but it, wasn't, it was a really, really uncommon thing. Um, they're basically for butcher blocks. Even shooting board planes were bubbled down. Um, but uh, a lot of power tool people like bevel up planes because they, they actually, it makes sense because your force of thrust is in line with your iron. Um, whereas if it's beveled down, your force of thrust is out of line with your iron. Um, so it just doesn't make much sense, but it, it does once you've been doing hand tools for a while. Um, actually, this one is really not that bad. I did sharpen this one not too long ago. So let's actually just do this on the finest plate. This one doesn't need much more than a touch-up. It's not quite to just the stropping stage. I used it a little bit longer than that. I did quite a few chamfers with it. So I'm going to put this on here. Again, I'm going to lock it into my hand. Three fingers underneath, but only one is on this because it's so short. The longer ones, my other, one, my other fingers can get to. One finger on the corner, one finger in the middle, another finger over here. Adding even pressure. And grind. Let's see what that gave us. There we go. Nice little burr. Just enough. We can bring it over here. I know I, should, I said I should have added more buffing compound in this time, but eh, I'm lazy. <laughs> we'll wait another one. Actually, I'll probably wait another one of that because I'm like only one more plane on this. Oh, I've got the router plane too. I should do the router plane. And there we go. 
nice and sharp. Doesn't take much. So we put this back in, bevel up, set this down, lock it back in, and there we go. She's ready to work. Yay. Put that back up on there. Um, yeah, let's do the router plane. So, router plane. Um, why is that bumped up like that? That's weird. Oh, I just didn't tighten that down. That's why. Uh, so, UTER, and that is at 1040. Okay, so for the router plane, take it apart, you loosen the back, slide this up until it's loose on here, then you move the iron forward, and the iron falls out. And in this case, I could sharpen the foot. And a lot of these you can actually take a screw out so you can pull this head out. I generally don't like to do that. Um, and this one, this one's actually not too bad. So this one I'm just going to do on the fine. So what I'm going to do is pop this out. And I'm going to bring it over here to the edge of my bench. Put a little on there. And let's actually zoom this in a little more and focus it up. And then move over to this one so you can actually see it. Oh, I wasn't on the three already. <laughs> I can put this on here, bevel down. And I'm going to be putting as much pressure as I can right up on the tip. Let's move it a little farther over. And it's much easier to pull it at a little bit of an angle. If you push it at that, you tend to get some vibration running back. Um, unless you get your grip just right. And there's a lot of material here but the bevel itself is actually pretty good. Hmm, I got a little bit of a compound bevel on this. A little more rounding than I would like. I don't know if you can see that. I'm sharpening from about a sixteenth inch back from the tip all the way up. So I've got two choices, either number one, I can lift it up onto that secondary bevel and just do the front. Or, number two, I could take it back to a core stone and get that all down to a flat. Or, number three, I could actually turn it into a slight rounded edge. Um, and so I think I'm actually just going to do a secondary bevel on this one because the angle on this really doesn't matter that much. If I were doing end grain, I'd want it to be really nice and tight. But I'm just going to lift up a little bit on the back, just lifting these fingers up. You can see how it got really dark really fast. There, I've got a bevel, a burr, running all the way across there. I'm going to set it flat, roll the burr the other direction, clean off the plate, and then we come over to the strop. And again, for the strop, I've got a problem with it being on the edge, so I'm just going to lift it up. If I had this to do over again, I'd probably move the strop right up to the edge, cut off the plate right there, um, just because it's nice to do that occasionally. And then we can go on the back side. And then onto this again. And just like that. Nice and sharp. That's what I want. So we can put it back together, lift this up, so you can slide the iron in, put the iron to hook back onto the depth adjuster, slide the collar back down, tighten it up, and she's good to go. Router plane. Um, I don't know why router planes really scare a lot of people, but uh, they, they take a little more hand control. And one of the things you'll notice, my hands are getting really dirty. So usually at this point, I'd go and sharpen them because I'd be working with wood. Um, I'm not sure. I'd go and sharpen my hands. Uh, I'd go and wash them off because the next thing I do is grab a piece of wood. But because I'm just going on to sharpening something else, I'm just going to leave them dirty. Um, I don't like, care. especially if I'm working with, with oak, I take the steel that's on my fingers back to the oak and you get all sorts of weird colors that develop. Uh, I'm going to answer some questions here. Do you have a recommendation on where to sell a Lee Nielsen one and a half plane? Where to sell it? Um, the, well, the best place to sell right now for an individual is on the Can I Have It Facebook group. Um, they have an auction running each weekend. It's actually running right now through uh, Sunday night. Um, and that's usually the best place to, 
um, sell hand tools. Um, but if you have a, other things you want to sell, you can go to MWTCA Meet or throw it on eBay. Um, if you turned a burr on a normal plane iron, then put it bevel up on a standard bed angle, could it be used as a scraper plane? Um, no, because you wouldn't be, to get a scraping action, you actually need to be past 90 degrees. Um, so if a bed angle is at 45 degrees, and then you sharpen at 35 degrees, uh, that's going to give you 80 degrees angle. 80? 80 degrees angle. Um, and so you're still going to be 10 degrees back. So even if you put a burr on the front of it, that's going to be a really weak burr. Um, yeah, yeah, no. Uh, if you want to do that, then you, you'd sharpen the angle. And I have seen this quite a bit, is you actually take the, the plane iron and you sharpen it at something like a, um, a 70 degree angle. And then you can turn a burr on that. Because with the 70 plus the 45, then you're leaning forward far enough that you can actually have a burr um, on the front to, to scrape off. Um, but that's a lot of work for um, a scraper plane. Usually it's just cheaper to go buy like a, a Kuntz um, number 80. Um, you can buy them on, uh, actually they're on sale right now on Tay Tools. Um, and they're just as good as the Stanleys and they're, they're dirt cheap. Um, they're brand new tools that actually work pretty well. Um, Kuntz are great for um, cabinet scrapers. They are great for spoke shaves affordable tools that don't need a lot of specialty into them. And so if you want a scraper plane, go, go with that. Um, uh, should window cleaner be used on ceramic stones? No, on, uh, on ceramic, just water. Um, unless you want to turn them into an oil stone and then you put oil on them. Um, but water isn't going to, you don't have a problem with them uh, rusting. Um, and so the reason I use this on these is it evaporates quickly. So any leftover that the, what, that the rag doesn't get off will evaporate um, within a minute or two. And so there's no rusting problem on it with, with window cleaner. Um, on regular stones, you want to have it fully impregnated. Uh, the only problem there is don't let them, don't let them freeze. Um, so you don't need to worry about window cleaner on there. And there's no reason to rusting, so there's no reason to use that. Um, Cool. Um, I got one more that I want to do. Unless you guys have something specific, we're going to do the uh, the Stanley number four. Of course, the simple one. Actually, yeah, the Stanley number four because that, that one doesn't need it right now. Um, and then we'll move on to saws. So in this one, I have um, this one. I have a, uh, a Lee Nielsen iron. It's one of the two Lee Nielsen, actually three Lee Nielsen items I own, and then an experimental DFM um, chip breaker that actually has a 50 degree. And I'm really hoping he actually sells these because I do like it. You have to modify the plane a good bit um, to fit it in. Um, but I love this really thick, heavy set. And especially with the, uh, the reed yokes, um, you can buy these and you can then file them to fit exactly into your chip breaker. And so if you have a really thick iron like these Lee Nielsen's, um, this works great because it's much longer so it can stick through into the thicker irons. So let's take this apart, slide the chip breaker back, rotate it 90 degrees, oop, back up, there we go. And then, oop, I rotated, I tightened it back up, loosen a bit more, slide it forward and out, and out, there it goes. So this one, oh my word, that's dull. Okay, we're gonna need to do some work on this. Um, yeah, this plane is, I used this long past when it should have been. Actually, I may have used this on that refinishing project I was doing, so I was um, grinding off some uh, lacquer. I hate lacquer. I hate putting it on. I hate working with it. I hate removing it. It's one of those finishes that I just can't stand. I know. A lot of people out there love lacquer. Ugh. Give me poly any day over lacquer or even a varnish. But lacquer? <laughs> okay, so let's grind this sucker out. Wow, that was fast. That one actually cleaned up really well. well. I guess I was on the extra course. I got a nice burr running all the way across it. Scratch pattern on there. Um, and that one is at a diagonal, so I'm gonna put this one straight across so that I'll get a different scratch pattern on there. 
There we go. On to the fine and extra fine. Change the scratch pattern again. Good. Nice, shiny scratch pattern. Clean off the plates. Don't let stuff sit on them. Come back over here. Let's just take that burr, flip it back the other way. Doesn't need much. And then we can go on to the strop. Two, three, four, five. Flip it over. One, two. One, two, three, four, five. Go back and forth. That burr is just barely hanging on. There it goes. Tiny little burr. And that's sharp. I love the feeling of that. This will make a really nice smoother. This is uh, my second go-to smoother. And so, ooh, don't slide across the tip. This one I put in really nice and close to the edge. This one with that 50 degree chip breaker on there. Um, I get a really nice curl on it. Tighten that cap up as much as I can with my hand. Then come over here and crank it down. I love this chip breaker and iron combo. Really thick iron, really thick chip breaker. Um, only thing to make it better is if the iron was PMV 11. That's my favorite. So I'm gonna slide this in. And lock it down. What am I running into? Oop, missed the hole, that's why. Lock it all down. Clamp, clamp, there we go. Iron ready backed up, and that one's ready for a shop. So, um, anything else I should sharpen before we move on to saws? Let me just read through some of this. Um, no, I think we're pretty good. All right, let's move on to saws. And for saws, um, you generally need a saw vise. And I don't like a lot of the little steel ones that you can buy. This one is one that I made. Um, and I made it a while ago. It's one of my favorites. Um, a little dusty. Um, but <laughs> dusty because I haven't sharpened in a while. Let me write this down before I forget. Uh, number four. What time was that? That was at like 47. Um, so I've got a couple videos on making this one. Um, as well as plans available on the site. And this is, it's just one of my favorites. It's long enough I can do a whole handsaw with it. Uh, but yet, um, sturdy enough and light enough, I can move it around. I'm going to move some of the cameras around so you can actually see more of what is actually going on. So we'll move over to here. And I'm going to lift this one up because you want the saw to be about as high as you can get it. Um, so that, here. Let's do that. Um, you want it to be up high so that you're not, so you can actually get close to it. Look, it's going to be a little lower than this because it actually goes down into my vise. I'm going to open my vise up. And this one is designed to fit down into that. A little bit more. And so it can be loose and still run on these styles. You want it a little bit below your armpit. So you could be running across it and looking down at it. You want your eyes close to the, the saw itself. So we're going to start off with my big hand saw. This is a rip cut, and I'm going to put it in here. And it's a fairly aggressive saw. This is something that's designed to remove a lot of material very quickly. I want to work it down as low as I can get it. Um, but in this case, the plate is tall enough that it actually runs into my screw. Um, so I've got a little bit more vibration up here than I'd like. Once that's in, then I can crank down these nuts. Did I really just say that? show you what this looks like. So I can turn these two down pretty much as far as they will go, making sure I still have enough material in there. Crank this one down as far as it will go. And then I can put added pressure with my vise and I can actually crank this down a little bit more and that'll give me just that much more squeeze. So this plate is in here really, really, really tight. Next thing we need to do is we need to determine which file 
are we going to use? And there is much, much consternation when it comes to saw sharpening. Um, in saw sharpening, um, actually, let me write this down before I get. Sorry, I want to make sure I put this on here. Uh, 54. Need to get that on there for the future. Um, there is a lot of <sighs> perfectionism that comes when it comes to sharpening. Uh, there are people who follow the distant rules of sharpening to the T, but then you have to ask yourself which distant rules of sharpening because he put out several different ones that were slightly different um, over the decades and decades of distant saws being sharpened. Um, and also on top of that, uh, there are so many different schools of thought and different methods and um, if you don't sharpen it exactly like so-and-so teaches, you're doing it wrong. And it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. So I'm going to show you what I do. It's just a simple, quick way to do it, and I get great results that really work well. Um, it's fast. It's efficient. Is it absolutely perfect? No. Could I make it slightly better? Yeah. Um, do I need to? No. Um, so first thing I need to do is pick the file that I'm going to use. Uh, what size? And so a lot of people are going to say this is a 5 ppi handsaw. And so for that, you need to have a 7 inch regular or a 7 inch slim um, or whatever size. And I really don't prescribe to that, saying that you need this size for that. Uh, what I do is I take the file and I set it in there and I see if it matches what I want it to do. So let me bring this over so I can actually change things. And I'm going to show you a really, really close-up shot. I'll get as close as I can. And maybe, if I want to, I actually have a microscope lens that I can put on here um, that we might do later. So I want to be looking at, like, this tooth where my finger is at. And let's focus on that. And then change over to this. So let's see if we can see this. Now, what I'm going to put on here, actually, it's coming from underneath. And I want to be looking at like this tooth. Ooh, I can do that. Let's see if I can do this tooth here. Can I focus on that one? Not quite. I need to back up just a hair. Let's focus on like here. That's about as sharp as I'm going to be able to get it. There we go. So I'm going to put this on here. And what I want to see is that the tooth comes up to the middle of the file. I don't want it to go past. And on this one, it's right about the middle of the file. Uh, and so that lets me know this is the file I want. What happens is, because this is a triangular shaped file, if I'm doing it on this side, I'm going to be using the bottom half of this side and the bottom half of this side. But if I rotate it, then I'm going to be using the other two sides. And if I rotate it again, I'm going to be using the other two sides. If a tooth reaches the middle of the face of the file, you're going to wear out the middle twice as fast. And so you're going to ruin this twice as fast. So what you want is a file where the tooth doesn't quite reach the middle. If it comes right to it, that's, that's fine. But if it's a little ways away from the middle, that's, that's great. Um, so you want to find a file that um, is bigger, is more than twice the length of your tooth. So if your tooth is three millimeters long, you want to have a face that is more than six millimeters wide. Um, next, I'm going to use um, a gauge here. Did I put those back? Ah, oh, shoot, I didn't. Mm, oh, just a second. I got to grab some Allen wrenches because um, my drawer dropped out. And that remind me, <laughs> my drawer's dropped. <laughs> I don't have my Allen wrenches. There they are. Um, because I have a little jig that I use to set up on the end of this. The next question then is, now we've picked the right file, we need to know what orientation. Now when it comes to rip teeth, that's perfectly fine because the file needs to be 90 degrees to the plate. Uh, if it's cross cut, then you start putting in some fleam, which means it's no longer 90 degrees, it's something else. So let me show you what I'm talking about here. Ooh, back up, we don't need to be quite that much. There we go. So what we have is the, uh, the rake. Um, and so right now, this needs to be 90 degrees to it. If I put, excuse me, the fleam. If I put the fleam into it, I'm going to be rotating this at a certain degree to the, to the, uh, the, the plate. Uh, so for cross cut, we're going to be rotating it. 
but for rip cut, 90 degrees is what you want. There are some people who will put a little bit of an angle this way. I don't do that at all for any of mine. Um, then the next thing is the rake, which is how far do you roll this forward and back. Um, with an aggressive cross cut, I like to make the back of this almost 90 degrees. Um, so I'm getting a pretty aggressive cut. It's actually rolled just a little bit back. Um, so I'm not getting a perfect cut, but if I really want an aggressive cut, I can actually push the back of this past 90 degrees um, and get a very, very aggressive tooth that's hooked forward and grabbing out the wood. But to set up all those angles, I actually use a jig like this from Veritas. And you can actually make similar ones out of wood. Um, but this one's nice because I can actually set my fleam so I have something to eyeball to. And then I can actually set uh, the rake of the roll that I want on this. So we are going to loosen all this up. And I need my Allen screw to pull this one out. Oh my, I've been on the wrong camera. I'm sorry. Here is the Veritas jig. So let's go over this one more time, sorry. This is fleam if you rotate it 90, more, uh, more than 90 degrees. For a rip file, or for a rip tooth, we want it to be at 90 degrees. The rake then is rolling this backward and forward. So what I'm wanting is the back of this file. The, the toe of my saw is that way. I want the back of this file to be a little bit less than 90 degrees. Um, so 90 degrees would be very aggressive. If you push it even farther, then it'd be really, really aggressive. I want it to be um, out. So zero would be with the top of this flat, each of these at 30 degrees. Um, and then if you roll it 30 degrees forward, that puts the back of this at 90 degrees, if that makes sense. <laughs> So um, let me grab this, see if there's any questions on here. Switch cameras, please. Did he sharpen a draw knife? Yes, yeah, I sharpened a draw knife earlier. Um, so once this goes live, you can go back and check it. I will have um, timestamps down below to everyone. Um, so if you want to watch all of those eventually, I'm taking breaks to fill those out. So I gotta loosen this up. Let me find, is it 10 millimeter? No, it's not. All right. Um, Two millimeter? If I remember correctly, it's millimeters. No, yeah, it's English, even though it's a Canadian thing. You never know when something's made in Canada if it's metric or imperial. So let's try this one. There it goes. And let's loosen it up. So I'm going to clamp this on to the end of this. And so there's enough space in there that this can slide in, but I need to pull oop, this set screw out of the way. Back the set screw all the way up. Then we can slide this in, and I can clamp that set screw down. Here, let me do, where'd it go? There it is. So I can clamp this set screw down there. And then I can roll this angle to whatever I want. And so I'm going to put it at, uh, actually, no, I'm going to want to put it at that angle. And so I'm just going to match the tooth that I had in the past. I'm going to set this in until I match it right there, turn it around, and I'm going to lock this set screw underneath in place. And that has it at. Uh, what, 25 degrees. So I'm just shy of it being at 90 degrees. So now that that's on there, now I'm gonna take this gauge and I'm gonna put it to 90 degrees, or in this case, zero degrees. So now this is locked on. I have this visual aid to let me know if I'm turning, it will then show on there. So um, now that all that's on there, now if you wanna see more on this, I have a whole Everything I've done, I've got at least two videos on every tool, um, how to sharpen it. Um, so if you want to see more specifics on this, I have other videos with really close-ups on it. Uh, but I'm going to do um, hand saw is what we're sharpening now. And that was at uh, 204. Four. Okay. Um, so one of the things people want to know is when do you know when is a saw dull? And this one is actually not that dull. I sharpened it not too long ago, um, but it just needs a little touch up. One of the easiest things you can do is come back here by the heel and feel the last four or five teeth. 
you almost never use those last four or five teeth. And so you feel those, know what that feels like, and then you come up here to the middle and you go, oh yeah, those aren't quite as good. And so you can feel the difference between it. Eventually, you're going to be sharp, you're going to be going with a saw and you just know that, yeah, this one isn't all that sharp. First thing I do is grab the mill file. And this one doesn't need much, so I'm probably only going to need one pass of the mill file on this. Um, and I'm going to run this. I'm going to do a couple broad stroke shots with this one. And then I'll do some close-ups. So I'm going to grab my mill file, and there's lots of other ways you can get jigs to hold this exactly at 90 degrees. I just put it on here and I let my fingers slide on this. I put this on here, I'm just going to one, run one pass from one end to the other. And what that's going to do is I'm going to put a little flat spot on every tooth. And I want to make those flat spots just, just barely disappear. Let me give a close up on this and show you what I talk about. Three. Let me see if I can do this. Not quite. Gotta see how close I can get this camera. Otherwise I might have to get my microscope. Okay, so you can see this little shiny spot here and here, and then these ones get out of focus and you can't quite see it. That shiny spot, you see that this one has a lot, this one has a little bit, this one has a little bit less, this one has a little bit less. Um, I want to get rid of that shiny spot on the top of every tooth. And that is what we're just doing. So, let's back this up and get you an idea. I'm going to start back at the heel. It really doesn't matter if you start at the heel or toe. A lot of people will tell you, oh, you've got to start at the heel. And others are saying, you've got to start at the toe. Um, I don't really care. I'm going to set this on here, and I'm probably going to need one or two strokes per. This is where it's going to get noisy. One stroke. Yeah, I'm just needing one stroke. And I'm looking at the tooth in front of the file. And then every now and then glancing at, where's that there? Be glancing at the jig and making sure that this line is level and parallel. Just like that. This one is relatively sharp, so marching down the saw doesn't take that long. And this is why I don't do live saw sharpenings that often. It takes just a little bit of concentration. I, I used to flip around the saw and do every other tooth even on the, uh, the rip cuts, um, but I only do that on the cross cuts now. I haven't noticed enough of a difference to make it worth doing half at one time and half at the other time. There's a couple teeth here in the middle I've had to do two times. I'm trying to get rid of that flat spot. Let me do a really close up on this and show you what I'm looking at because there's a couple here that are bad. So let's see if I can zoom in on these. No. Nope, I'm going to have to come in a little closer to see these. Trying to keep my finger on it so I know which tooth I'm on. So it's really easy to lose, lose track of which tooth you're on. Sorry. Let's see, can I focus on this one right here? Almost. I'm back it up just a hair more. I think you can see it. So shiny spot right here, shiny spot right here. I just sharpened this tooth, no shiny spot. So I'm going to set this on here and I'm going to see. One stroke, still have a tiny bit of a shiny spot. Half stroke, just got rid of that shiny spot. Next one. Oh, quarter stroke. There we go, got rid of that one. That one's good. 
That one's good. And so that's what I'm looking for. I'm just getting rid of that tiny little shiny spot on each one of these. And then as I get close to the end, um, this one, they had sharpened the, the main saw is at like 5 PPI, and this is up at like 7 PPI, so I have smaller teeth up here. Uh oh, I lost track of where it's at. There we are. When saws really get dull, they become very easy to see where you were last at because you have these shiny spots and not shiny spots. So this is a live speed for a touch-up sharpener. See the smaller teeth, I'm using even less of a stroke. And there we go. One saw sharpened and ready to go. I'll loosen these up all the way because the vise is still holding it in place. These are just adding a little bit extra. And then I can open up the main vise, and there we go. Now normally I'd take this over and see if it's turning one way or the other. Because I'm just touching it up, I really don't need that. The other thing you're going to see, I'm not doing any um, setting on this because I just took off a little bit. Usually I sharpen it five, six times before I do any setting. Especially with big teeth like this, I just don't set that often. Um, I might be doing some setting on my crosscut saw, but next, I have a rip cut panel saw, uh, excuse me, cross cut panel saw. This one needs a little bit more work. So we're going to set this up. Let me go look at any questions before I really clamp this one down. Oh, before I start working on this one. I'm gonna get those teeth sticking up just an eighth inch or so, so that there's less vibration. Crank down that vise. Crank down these. There we go. Ah, uh, see. Four years. Can I sharpen a 26 inch cross cut saw into a rip saw? Sure, you just change the orientation of the file. So you rotate its fleam and angle and uh, you're good to go. Now for this next one, it has smaller teeth. So I'm gonna be getting rid of this one and I'm gonna find one where it just comes up halfway through, which is usually gonna be this one. Let me make sure. Actually it needs to be a little larger than that. So I'm gonna grab this one. Oh, wait, I got this one here, don't I? Let's see that. Eh, no. But I do need a handle on that one. So I'm going to be taking the handle off of this one, putting it onto here. Especially with a saw of sharpening, you, you usually want a handle on these. Not necessary, but it is very, very comfortable. And uh, you don't want it running into your palm. So I'll stick that handle on there. Put it into the jig, Oop. tighten the jig down on it, and then we can start setting up our angles. So in this one, there's a good bit of fleam on here. So let's loosen up the fleam. Um, let's see. The rake, last time I had, rake is usually at like nothing. Um, and so I'm gonna set that right here. So my rake is like, three degrees off. Um, and then my fleam, I'm gonna match it up to what I had in the past, which is right there. So we're at 25 degrees fleam. 
right about where I want it to be. Usually around 2530 is where I'm gonna have it for most crosscut saws. And with this, I'm gonna do every other tooth um, because every other tooth comes at an angle this way and then every other tooth has to come at an angle that way. And so you've gotta change the settings backward and forward. We're gonna take our mill file, do the same thing we did before, just run it along all the teeth. This one needs a bit more, so I'm going to do two passes. I want to make sure it hits pretty much every single tooth along the way. And then we can bring this in and start doing the exact same thing every other tooth. Back here, I don't need that much. I'll need more when I get up towards the middle. Every now and then I'm going to stop and check that my gauge looks right. Here, let me show you a couple little tricks that I have on this. Is that I have... Um, I have this tape on here, and I have it down to the point where I'm going to be touching the tape. And so that lets me know the one I was last working on. Smaller teeth tend to scream a lot. And this is why I don't do a lot of saw sharpening live videos. Some people will use um, headlamps um, or even I have a magnifying glass that I can put in my dog hole. Actually, I'll show you what that looks like. I've got a magnifying light that I'll use sometimes when I really need something. Um, oop, don't need my iron on there. Except for it's plugged in way over there. I don't know if it's going to reach it. Um, but this allows me to get right up on it, except for it's a bit too far away, so it's just going to fall down on, I'm not going to be able to hold it. Um, but I'll use that sometimes. But most of the time it's close enough that i got to find out where I was last at. There we are. Brings new meaning to noise, nose to the ground, ground zone. One messed up tooth from last time I was here. Messed up more than a few shirts, dragging them over with my elbow. <laughs> I 
I can't remember the last time I sharpened this one. It needs a bit of work. Almost there. Hmm, that one loosened up a bit. Don't want that. So there's a super chat. I'll check it in this moment. Here. One more. There we go, half the teeth. Then we can rotate around. Oh, Richard Garrow, thank you, man. Uh, how often do you typically sharpen your saws? Uh, my hand saw, I use that one more than anything else. Oh, well, at least more than any of my main saws. That one usually gets sharpened twice a year. I probably should sharpen it a little bit more than that, but about twice a year. Uh, my, my tenon saw, it's probably the most used saw in my shop, and I let that one get a little duller, and it should. That one I probably should sharpen twice a year, but generally I sharpen about once a year. My dovetails once a year to once every two years. Um, this one is usually about once every two years. Um, I don't sharpen them that much. There are a lot of people out there who sharpen them all the time. Um, and a dull saw just means that it's a little slower. It's not that big a deal, it's just slower. So now I need to change the settings on this gauge. And the nice thing about it is I want them to be the exact same, but I want them to be the other angle. So in this case, I had 25 degrees that way. So now we're going to switch it to 25 degrees this way. And I had it five degrees off fleam this way. So now we're going to move it five degrees fleam off the other way. Or not fleam, rake. Crank both of these down. And so now it's ready to go in the other direction. Yay! Um, but that means that I've got to rotate around um, because now I've got to saw the other tooth going that way. Uh, so I'm actually going to move. Actually, I'm just going to leave it on this one because it's going to be about the same. So in this case, I'm going in this direction. Line these all up. And we do every other tooth the other way. Usually my first stroke is pretty heavy. That rotate, oh, that's right where I need to be. My first stroke is fairly heavy. And then my second stroke is a little lighter. It's more of the come and clean up stroke. Why does it feel like my rake is moving slightly? Because it is moving ever so slightly. I need to crank that down a bit. Oop. This is one I've been putting off for a while. And it shows because I should be using it more than I do. But every time I go to grab for it, it's like, oh, that one's dull. And then I put up with it, and then I hate, I hate it, and I should really just spend the time and sharpen it more. But I'm lazy. 
Don't tell my wife that though. Now those are looking really nice. Let me give you a close up on what these look like sharp to dull. Let's see, we are here. And let's actually move over here. So we should be looking right here. Come on. There we go. So what you'll notice here is that, let's see, where am I at? Oh, no, I'm back here. Let's move you over just to here. So here, you can see there's a nice, shiny, oh, come on, focus. There we go. Shiny spots, every tooth. And you're getting this nice, standard geometry. Then you get over here, and you have this short gullet, short gullet, short gullet, short gullet, and that's the every other. So I got to hit these short gullets to get them all down so that they're all the same height as these ones. And that's the, the goal. They always look bad on the first pass, and then on the second pass, it's like, oh yeah, now they're looking right, now they're looking right. So where was I at? I was here, right there. Every now and then checking my gauge, making sure I'm still at the right angle. So, what saw should I do next? I've got a dovetail saw, I have a carcass saw, and I have a tenon saw. All three of them need to be sharpened. When I get this one done, I'll look at the comments and I'll do whichever one is the highest. If anyone actually has their headphones or speakers on. But I feel really bad for anyone with headphones. Over halfway. I guess it's over three quarters because I'm on the second side. Saw sharpening is one of those zen moments. It's nice when you really get into it and you get in the groove and everything just kind of flows. You tune out the sound and you just enjoy it and chew on your tongue. Last tooth. There we go. Just gonna do one quick pass. And those look good. Cool. Now we can open up. So what saw should I do next?
Dovetail saw. Like to see dovetail saw. Huh. Yeah, Paul is in the UK. Um, he came to the US for a while, a few years ago, but he's back in the UK now. Oop, I'm going the wrong direction, that's why. <laughs> like, why does this feel like it's getting tighter? Because I'm cranking out the wrong direction. Here we go. That is happy. Actually, this blade has a bit of a bend to it, ever so slight. Let me see if I can show you this. Um, here. Up, rotate. Here. Let's see if I can show you guys this eyeball. So if I lift it up, see it has an ever so slight bend to it. It's right about here. Actually, it looks like it's a little bit up here, too. Oh, yeah, it's bent up there. So I'm going to grab this whole plate. I'm going to bend it just like that. I'll show you this end. Still a little bit right up in here. So let's bend it there. A little bit more. There we go. Now just a little bit up in here. Let's see if I can get rid of that. It's the nice thing about spring steel. So you can work it down and get it out. There we go. Nice saw. Ready for the work. So let's do a dovetail saw then. Uh, da, 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 da. Dovetail saw. I'm going to do my uh, um, um, black bear, not black bear, um, bear cat. There's the word. Uh, what is it? 31. Uh, Is it two? And then we're going to do dovetail. And that's at 32. All right, so dovetail saw. This is a rip saw. Um, so it's done exactly the same way as the big hand saw, just smaller. Um, and so for this, I've got to be a little more careful. I'm going to put it in here just the same way I normally do. Um, now with this one, I would love to get a better um, um, saw vise for this one because it hangs out about an inch past the end. I'll show you that here in a moment. Um, but you work with what you got, and you got what you work with. You don't whine and complain. You just get the work done. People who whine and complain about it. I don't have the right tools to do that. You never have the right tools because there is no such thing as the right tool. Unless I have it, then of course it's the right tool, because, you know, I'm right. <laughs> My wife and I have arguments. She says, I'm right, and I say, no, I'm right by blood. So, little teeth, really, really little, little teeth. And I need to grab a little, little file. And so in this case, I'm going to try and find a little file. Do I not have a little file? I don't have no oh, there it is. I'm going to make sure I drop my files on the floor. And I'm going to come at it with a little file. And so with this, just a tiny bit of movement. Uh, that one doesn't, that doesn't sound right. It's a little too bouncy. Let me try this one. Yeah, that's better. OK. It can be often hard to put pressure on there because you got to get both sides on it. This one I'm not going to joint. Um, dovetail saws usually don't dull up that quickly, so I don't sharpen them that much. But if I feel the difference between the teeth here at the back and the teeth in the middle, there, there's a significant difference. Um, so I'm not going to joint these all because those tiny teeth, you're not going to see it and you're not going to do that much. As long as you put the same amount on every one, and I'll usually do five, six, maybe seven sharpenings. Um, Actually, probably do about four um, that I've done since the last time I've jointed it. I probably have one or two more until I'm going to joint it again and do it again. And when I do that, that's where I pull out this thing and I get really close to it because you're not going to see the tiny little shiny spots on here. So on this one, this one I just completely freehand it because there's no way I'm going to be able to clamp this jig on there. It's not going to work. It's just so small. 
And uh, a lot of people really get worried about dovetail saws because it's, <gasps> it's a dovetail saw. Um, honestly, it's a saw just like any other. And because there are so many small teeth, if you mess up on a few of them, it, it's not going to make any difference. You're never going to notice the difference on it. So let's get in here, make sure I've actually got this. And so I'm just going to match it up to what's already there. And these ones are going to get hard to see. So I'm going to pull out another trick, which is to hide the tool I'm looking for. I need a Sharpie. Where did my Sharpie go? Is it out on the counter? Yeah, it is. It's out on the bench. So I can put this on here. I'm actually going to saw the tip off of this, basically. I'm going to hit all the teeth with the Sharpie. And when that little bit of dark spot disappears, I've done that tooth. So let's put this in here, find the right orientation. Just like that. That's all it takes. And again with this, my dovetail saws have almost no set in them. And it's going to be a while until I do another setting on them. Get in the right slot. If you guys want me to, let me know in the comments and I might put in my microscope lens and do a really, really close up on these and show you what they look like. It's going to look really horrible. And you're going to look at them and go, I can't believe you used that. I thought it'd be kind of fun. But if you want to see that, let me know. Got another three minutes or so of this. There are a lot of these little teeth. And there's a reason that a lot of people use um, magnifying headlamps because they can be very, very hard to see. Kind of here, the pace eventually picks up as you kind of get into that rhythm. One of the reasons why people don't like, or some people don't like to file it all from one side, is you push a burr out onto the far side. And so the first few strokes with a newly sharpened saw with all the burr on one side, means it's going to start to veer off course to that one side. But after a couple passes with it, that burr is gone and no longer has that problem. So you have a lot of people who run into the problem of it, oh no, it's veering off to the side, and they go and stone it, and then they have the problem going in the opposite direction then. Because the burr wears off and they stoned the wrong side. <laughs> I do know some people who do it all from one side and then they immediately stone the far side. Now oh, they're looking good. Where am I at? There, Matt. Getting it closer and closer. Getting a lot of metal dust on my file. Makes it harder to see. More chewing of the tongue, the better. sliding down a bit. It's a little looser than I'd want, but it'll work. Actually, one trick you can do when this is not tight enough right at the end is grab a hand screw clamp, 
stick it up from underneath and clamp down right here on the edge. Really should bring this one. Should get a, uh, a smaller one for these, but this one works okay. And if you don't have a saw vise, you can always just stick it between two sticks and put those two sticks in the vise. That's what I did for a long time, actually. And it works really well. Just you got to be lower then. The big thing about this is being able to do it up higher makes it easier to see. Every now and then I miss a tooth and I have to go back and clean it. Sharpie makes it a lot easier to see these little teeth. I don't use it on the big ones because those you tend to see, but these tiny little, I want to say, if I remember correctly, this one is 18 ppi. So the space between every tooth is less than a sixteenth of an inch. Almost there. Inch more to go. It's getting louder out here because now we're in an unsupported plate. But I almost never use this section of the plate. Because for most things it's just too thin. Four more teeth, or five more, something like that. One more. There we go. Tiny, tiny little teeth. Let's see, should I get out the microscope? Yeah, I don't see anyone asking for the microscope, so I'm gonna leave that one alone because it's takes a bit to set that one up. So we got that. Now I need to do, I'm going to do one small uh, cross cut, which is the carcass saw, which is the most used saw in my shop. Open up, says me. Yay. That one's pretty. Like that. Looking forward to using that. Now we're going to do the carcass saw. Uh, so if there's anything, I'm going to be, I think this is going to be the last saw I'm going to do. So if there's anything particular you want to see, uh, let me know and I can go back and do that. Or if someone throws up a super chat, then I definitely will. Uh, but we're probably going to call it an end of the live after this saw. Unless someone has something that they really want to see, then let me know. We might be able to make it happen. This one I can get in a little farther. I'm still going to use that hand clamp right at the end. The little teeth. There we go. Now with this, it's cross cut again. It's little teeth. If I remember correctly, this one's 14 ppi. It looks like about it. So I'm going to set this up with a much smaller file. Uh, let's see. I'm going to use this one. Nope, that one doesn't feel right. I think that one's about trash now. I think I want to use this one. No, that one's about trash too. It's about time to get some new files. Usually they only last a few sharpenings, so it's not something you worry that much about. So I'm just finding one that feels right. Yeah, that's the one I want. One that's about the right size. I'm going to set those two away to throw those away and order some new ones. Um, a really good file, you can get about a dozen sharpenings out of it. A cheap one, you get about five or six. So that's why a lot of times I tell people for the bang for the buck, go get a cheap one, you'll get more sharpenings out of it. And the cutting difference really isn't that much. Um, so don't, uh, 
Don't worry about it. Ah, uh, my local joinery shop has a young woman apprentice who loves woodworking. Can we sharpen Japanese saws? Some of them, yes. However, you have to very, very specific feather files. Um, and I don't have any, nor do I have one that is sharpenable. Most Japanese saws are intended to be disposable unless you get um, historical Japanese saws. Um, then those aren't. Now with this one, I want to put it at about five degrees of rake, except I want it to rake the other direction. So let's loosen that up. And I want about 20 degrees of flame on this. Because uh, it's a cross cut. We're going to crank that down. Now we got this all set up just like we did before. Uh, I don't think so. It's just a question as we see a lot of woodworkers on YouTube. Yeah. Most of the Japanese saws, the ones you buy on Amazon and, and uh, most tool sellers, um, those aren't sharpenable. They're intended to be disposable. You buy a new, new blade for it. Um, but there are historical, traditional ones that are intended to be sharpened. They're just a lot more work. Um, if they have hardened teeth, then no, they're disposable. So, um, yeah, let's do the Sharpie thing on this again because these are tiny. And then... We got to do it from halfway from one side and halfway from the other side. This is a great way to destroy a Sharpie really quickly. There we go. Now back at it. Half of them one way, half from the other. Again, they're so small that I don't joint them unless I absolutely have to. If they're still looking good, there's still not a lot of vibration in the saw, then I don't sharpen them, or I don't uh, joint them. These ones you have to be more careful with, because you have to make sure you hit the right tooth, because you don't want to backfile your crosscut teeth. Oops. Not like I've ever done that before. This is one of these things where I like to set aside a whole day or a chunk of a day and go through and sharpen everything in the shop. Because next time I come down to the shop, it's like, oh yes, everything works, everything's great, everything's awesome. And it's so nice when all the tools are sharp and clean, but it's far more efficient to do them all at once rather than after each use. Because you don't have to pull out everything every time. Oops, doubled up on that one. I'll go to this one. Almost there, another inch. There's all from one side. Uh, yeah, well, there's a lot of argument about setting before or after. Setting before or after is, there's, yeah. I prefer to set my rip cut before I sharpen. 
I prefer to set my cross cut after I sharpen. Um, so it, it, there, there's a lot of argument about it and different people will say different ways and different gurus will tell you different things and there is no right or wrong. It's just what uh, the other person says. So anytime someone talks about how to sharpen, take it with a grain of salt, me included. Uh, if I say this is the way to sharpen, understand this is just how I sharpen. Uh, there is no right or wrong way to sharpen just the way that works well for you. And I'm reversing these. So I have five degrees of rake one way, 20 degrees of rake, uh, 20 degrees of fleam in the other direction. And we're gonna unclamp this whole thing, rotate around and do the other teeth, yay! So if there's anything particular you wanna see, throw it in the, the chat. Uh, I don't know, but we'd love to see a gouge sharpened. Sure, I'll do that after this. Just got a few more minutes of this and we will move on to sharpening the gouge. So in this case, here, let me do this camera up close right here. Let you see these as close as I can get them with this camera. Except for let's move you up a little bit higher. Not that close. Come on, work with me here. There we go. Three, and let's go at them from the other angle. And I need this over here. And let me make sure I'm doing this right, there and there. Okay, I gotta wrap my brain around this side. I actually gotta see what I'm sharpening. Generally helps. Just removing sharpie marks. <laughs> Occasionally checking back on the gauge, making sure it's at 90 degrees. Oh, sorry, move this up a little bit. And let's focus on this spot now. There we go. Now where was I? I was here. Oops, don't do that one. <laughs> Looked for a moment like I missed one. Oops, doubled it.
take down this last tooth. There we go. Nice and sharp and pretty. Happy, happy. So there's those. Um, someone asked for sharpening a gouge. I think I can do that. And if there's anything else, might have a couple minutes left to do a couple more items. But uh, that was the majority of it. Let's see. Clean this up a little bit. Uh, sorry, but my English isn't good. The way each tooth is bent out to the side of the saw plate is called set. Yes. Um, so what happens is when your teeth, so if you imagine for a second, your teeth are all in a plane like this. Every other tooth gets bent out to the side. And so that is called set. Um, what that does is it means that the actual slot that your saw is cutting is wider than the plate of the saw. So the slot you're cutting is thicker than this plate, so there's less friction on it. It also gives you a little bit of control so you can turn. The more set you have, the more you can turn and control it. The problem is, the, the more set you have, the bigger area you're cutting and the more work it's gonna take. So usually as you get better with a saw, you want less and less set. As you're beginning, you want a lot of set so that you have more control over it and you can, you can play with it, but you're gonna be doing more work in the end. Um, so it's kind of one of those things that, um, different saws you want different set. Usually the bigger the teeth, the bigger the set. The smaller the teeth, the smaller the set. Dovetails have almost no set at all to, in some cases actually, some people don't have any set on them. Um, so it's kind of one of those things of what works best for you. Um, a gouge would be great. Thanks for the witty workshop. Um, oh, I didn't do that one, so let's do, um, what time is it, 57, so let's do, C-U-S-S um, is at two, Let's see, 243 is so we'll just guess there. You just clean up some of this and grab. Actually, I'm just going to set this over here. I'll clean it up later. Set that down. Let me go grab a gouge. See if I have one that needs to be sharpened. I think I do. And let's see what we got. Unless someone throws a super chat up, I think this will be the last one we'll do. But if someone does have something specific, throw a super chat up and I'll, I'll do it, I guess. Um, let me find one that needs some work. That one needs some work. This is a good old gouge. So let's start with the gouge at 58. Uh, 258. Okay, so for the gouge, let me move these cameras back so I can get in closer on that. Um, you imagine it, it's sharpening just like any regular chisel, um, but the difference is um, it, it, it's got a curve on it, which is kind of obvious, but um, it really isn't that big of a difference. So let me grab these, get that down in there. There we go. So let's move these over. Move these over, clean that all up afterwards. Um, gouge. So let's start here. Now with the gouge, um, this one, here, come on, focus on my hand. This one is relatively okay. Um, it's just not as sharp as it should be and it's just a little bit past where I can take it back to the diamond plates. And with a good sharpening gouge, you want it to be at about a 20 degree or even less. It's a very, very, very shallow angle. Oops, I'm on the wrong camera. There we go. So you can see very, very shallow angle on there. And so on this one, I'm actually just going to be using my finest plate. If I had a chip in there or something really nasty I had to grind out, then I'd take it back to the course. But in this case, I just need to touch it up a little bit and get rid of some of the edging on there. So I'm gonna set it on here and I'm gonna feel where that bevel is at. And it's right about there. And I'm gonna try and remember that with this. It's a lot lower than a plane, so it's something I just kind of remind myself I'm going for this angle. So let's add a little bit of Windex, or some cheap window cleaner. And I'm gonna put it up on this corner first. Actually, let me see if I can zoom in. 
a bit more here. There we go. So I'm going to put it up on this corner first. And if I imagine doing that, and then I'm going to slowly roll it from one side to the other. And a lot of times you'll actually watch my whole body moving with it. And I'll do that just to get it set up. I'm going to check the scratch patterns, see where I'm at. Yeah, doing pretty good. And then I could do another pattern, which would be this rocking motion. This is one of the more common ones. So I'm going to start it back up here on the wing, and as I move it, I'm going to rock it over onto the other wing. It's nice to have different motions you can do so you can try different scratch patterns and see how they come up. That one's looking good. Not quite getting over onto this tip. You do a little bit more back here. Or I can do just like I did with the um, uh, with the scrub plane. I can start it up on this corner as I pull it back. I roll up onto the other corner. This is all about the wrist. So my wrist is actually back up here. My wrist is actually rotating as I do that. So I'll start here. Do it the other direction. This one is needing a bit more work than I expected. And I'm feeling for the bevel inside. I've got most of it. There's a little bit up on the swing I haven't gotten to yet. Now, if I had a problem with the inside bevel, I'd bring in a slipstone and do that, or sandpaper on a dowel, and you can do it on that. Uh, but generally, I, I don't do that unless I have something really nasty I need to fix. I just keep the inside somewhat nice. And then we can take it over here onto the strop. I'm going to do the same thing, just letting it roll from one side to the other. Either go sideways or pull it in. Hey! Hi. Sarah does exist. I know. My lazy bum missed that. I'd come say hi. Uh, well, if you want to bring your face up. No. No? <laughs> so Sarah's in the shop. She'll read comments. Sarah's in her jammies. <laughs> <laughs> She's comfy. She's like on the back of the and then, here, let me show this a little closer. I'm going to wrap the strop up and then use that to polish the inside. One of the nice things about horse butt is it's stiff enough that when you bend it up, you get a really nice hard surface. And just like that. Yeah, that's what I want right there. Here, I'll do a little carving with it and show you what it looks like. Um, yeah, let's grab that piece I was working on earlier. We'll do it in some oak. You know, the traditional carving wood, oak. <laughs> it's actually one of the first woods I learned to carve in, which is a great way to learn because if you can do it in oak, you can do it in anything. Okay, is it, do I draw this small window up? Is that what I gotta do? Uh, yeah, small window, drag it up to the top. Yeah, hey, look, there, there she, she is. Looks. So let's see how this goes. Oh, I like that. And so then we can come in from this angle, and chop it out and do a stop cut. And then we can come in and do the flare again. Come up to this side, come up to this side, do something that's a little bigger than the gouge itself. Come back in again and do the stop cut. <sighs> Love those little windows. And then you can come from this side, come right where you left off. And then do it again this way. Set up your next stop cut. Oh no, I chipped out the edge. Oh well. Wiggle it down a little more. This is happy. So, so just finishing up this gouge, I was just playing. We've sharpened everything in the shop by now. So if there's something particular you want to see, I might do one more, but I think we're just about ready to wrap it up. Just want to finish up this and make me happy. That's all 
it's fun when you do a whole series of these in a line. It's a really cool detail shape running along. Oops, sorry, out of focus lately. There. So, that's a gouge. If, if it needs a lot of work, you do the exact same thing, you just take it back to a coarser stone. Um, and if it's really out of true, you actually start it on its nose and bring that nose flat, and then you can resharpen it until you get that point brought back to the, the flat spot. Um, I actually show how to do that in uh, how to sharpen a, uh, um, a corner chisel and uh, go over that, which a corner chisel is basically two chisels put together, which turns it into a, a weird type of V-gouge. I'm just gonna do a little more stropping on this. With most carving chisels, all I do is stropping and I'll do it eh, once every five to 10 minutes or so of regular work. The more you strop it, the less you're gonna have to sharpen it and you can get a really nice clean edge. Um, yeah, most of my carving chisels are uh, 20 degrees or so. Um, most of my bench chisels are at about 30 degrees. Uh, paring chisels, I put at about 25 degrees. Plain irons are all 30 to 35. Um, I don't make distinctions from softwood to hardwood. I know a lot of people do, but I, I don't. It's more work than it's worth in my book. Um, but you know, different people, different things for different people. Um, in general, the shallower your angle is, the faster it will get dull. But the easier it is to push into the work, um, with the exception of bevel down planes, because in that case, the cutting angle is not the angle on the bevel. The cutting angle is the angle of the frog. So the bevel down plane, it doesn't make it any easier to push to put it at 20 degrees or at 30 degrees. But in that case, if you put it up to a 30 or 35 degrees, you're going to get a much more durable edge that will last longer. And so that's why with planes, you put them up at a, a higher angle. Um, with things that you're actually going to be forcing into the wood, you put them down at a lower angle because it's more important to make them easier to push. Um, yeah, at least he's on the right camera now. <laughs> yeah, I, re that. I was reading back through the comments. <laughs> you think I'd get a raise after today. No. no. I'll double your pay. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> zero is still zero. <laughs> Ah, uh, dingy dingy. I have to admit, I really like James Way sharpening. Yeah, one of the things that I, I, I don't mess with sharpening that much unless it's necessary for a particular job. And then, then in that case, I'll take the time and I'll sharpen. Most of my sharpening is done all at one time because it's more efficient. I just get the tools out to sharpen once and then it's done. With the exception of my chisels, um, chisels are just so stinking easy. I never sharpened a chisel today. A chisel, let me show you how fast it goes. This one needs a little work. I'm going to take it back to the middle stone. And with a chisel, I'm going to set it on here. I'm going to go. Back to work. 30 seconds or less. And with this setup right there in the corner, uh, chisels always stay sharp because I don't have to take anything apart. I don't have to take the plane apart. I don't have to set up any jig. The, the stones are right here. It's good to go. Um, I don't think about it. And so chisels, I keep really, really sharp because they're so easy to sharp. Um, same thing with sharpening with uh, carving tools. They're so easy to sharp on a strop as long as you keep them sharp. Um, but yeah, uh, everything else takes more work. Planes, you got to take them apart and then do all the work and put them back together. And so anytime I can remove a step from the process, it makes it that much easier. Um, Oh yeah, I've only done two jokes, and I think I've gotten what, four or five super chats. <laughs> Do you have any mom jokes? Yeah, hang on, I. Was really <laughs> out here. Uh, oh, um, I'm lining up a live, probably not this week, but next Tuesday for um, Reed Tools. Um, been wanting to get him on here, and I'm trying to get on um, Jonathan Katz Moses. So Hi. hopefully he'll be coming on here soon. Um, and I want to do a couple more one-on-one uh, -on -one new woodworker lives, but I haven't gotten any of those lined up recently, so we'll see. He doesn't ask you, me. <laughs> no, you run the chat. You're good at that. Have you got a mom joke? Oh, hang on. Or should I wrap Where'd it up? Go? Ah, I thought I had it. 
Now, so anything I have here, if there's something particular you, you didn't see, I have a sharpening video on it somewhere. Um, otherwise, if you have problems with any particular sharpening, send me an email. I, I do answer, um, emails, I answer most every one of them because they're, um, they're, they bug me if I don't answer them. Um, I don't always see comments. I, I see all comments. I don't see replies on, on YouTube. So, yeah, it's not the best place to ask questions. But what do we got? Or should I give another one? Oh, I would love to hear yours first. Okay, let, me, let me grab out one of mine. Uh, <laughs> um. <laughs> Here's oh, a good one. I got one now, when you're done. Okay. What does a farmer say when he can't find his tractor? What? Where's my tractor? <laughs> was that funny, Arthur, or was that a bad joke? <laughs> okay, ready? Did you hear about the mermaid who liked math? The mermaid who liked math. I did not. What is about the mermaid who liked math? She wore an algae bra. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> On that note, I think we're going to wrap this one up, and uh, we'll have fun. So I hope you like this weird live version. Um, I threw it up in the, uh, the hive mind a uh, few weeks ago and they said, yeah, do it. That sounds like fun. Uh, so if you don't know, I have a hive mind group on Facebook as well as one on Discord. There are links to those in the description down below. At least I think there are. Um, if not, you'll see them in most recent videos. Um, but I bounce a lot of ideas off there and people throw up questions and it's just a really cool group that we can um, shoot the breeze about woodworking and uh, hang out together. Um, but I think that will do it for now. So um, until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye. Oh, I'm supposed to click oh, the button. Oh, yeah, yeah, you got to click the button now. You came down. You got to do some work now. Uh-oh, I'm about to die. I'll see you all folks later. <laughs> Maybe. Tuesday, he might be able to see out of one eye. I don't know where the <laughs> Yes, after two weeks, I'll see just a little bit out of this eye. All right. Bye. Bye.